We are back. It's 2021 after a much needed respite. Mr. Skolnick and I are in the saddle with a hotly awaited new edition of Roll On. This is the edition of the podcast where we check in on our respective goings on, pontificate on certain current events of interest. We share some wins, do a little show and tell, and as always answer some listener slash viewer questions from our voicemail, which you can ring up at 424-235-4626. Before we get into it, quick reminder that if you enjoy all the free content that we diligently toil week in, week out to create, it would be very meaningful and easy for you if you could take a second to hit the subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you enjoy the audio incarnation of the show. Leave a comment, share the show with your friends or on social media. Also, I should mention, we recently created a clips channel on YouTube, which is rather anemic right now in terms of subscribers. So <laughs> if you're into sampling the show or you wanna indulge in just the short nuggets, check it out. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes and in the description below on YouTube, or you can just search Ritual Podcast Clips on YouTube. Today is very exciting. We have a tweak on the tweak of our roll-on format. <laughs> We're gonna try something new today. Uh, for the first time in the history of roll-on, how many roll-on episodes have we done, I Adam? think it's like a do over a dozen. I thought it was 14, 30, this is, is the 14th, many? something like that. Yeah, wow. I know. We have some momentum here. Well, today, we're gonna bring on uh, a couple guests in a few, Arthur Jones and Giorgio Angelini, who you guys know as the filmmakers behind the wonderful movie, Feels Good Man. You're most likely familiar with them, if not from the movie, from a recent episode of the podcast, which although it just posted the other day, we actually recorded it back in early December, sometime in December. So I haven't seen these guys for a minute, even though they're just up on the podcast the other week. Uh, these guys are our internet culture decoder ring, and they're coming in hot to help us make sense of a few crazy recent events just a few. in culture. Just, just a, a few. few, right? Just a few. But first, Adam, how are you doing? I'm good. You know, I, I just subscribed to the YouTube channel earlier today. The Clips today. channel? No, the original <laughs> YouTube channel. It took you this long? You're actually on the I, show. You don't even I don't, subscribe? I don't, I don't subscribe to myself. Here's the thing. Like when you look at the analytics on our YouTube channel, we're doing great, but like something like 96% of, of the watches are from people that don't subscribe to the channel. Is that right? Which is odd. You're so being come fed. on, you guys, subscribe. Yeah. Look, look how long it took but you, you have to a do pretty, it. I know. I'm embarrassed about it, but you have a pretty good. It seems like the subscriptions are pretty solid on the on the it's, main. It's channel. doing well. We're yeah. we're in a groove right now. Yeah. As 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 I tweeted the other day, or shared the other day, the Andrew Huberman podcast eclipsed four million views. Yeah. Incredible. It's going to hit like four point five and another. Was, yeah, that was four point five like today that. already. Was it four? Is it four? I thought it was when I checked it. Three or something like something that. Something like that. It's insane. Like that podcast was, I don't know, nine months ago or something like that. And it's still cranking the YouTube algorithm gods for whatever reason, maybe Arthur and Giorgio can help us figure this yeah. out. Like, I don't know why they decided that one. Uh, it's a great episode, of course, but that one is crushing out there and it's bringing all kinds of new people to the show, which is Fantastic. cool. Fantastic. Welcome new people. But back to my question. How, How are you doing? I'm, we're, you know, everything is good. We're, uh, let's see, it's, I took... January, like you, just a little bit half speed. I was working, um, you know, maybe 15, 20 hours, or at least that was the plan, was to just mm -hmm. do some reading, catch up on some books that I've been wanting to read for forever and, and kind of pitch in a bit more with Zuma and hang out with right. the family a bit more. And then all hell broke loose in Washington and I was like, glued to the television for yeah. days on end, doom scrolling. <laughs> but so that was my downtime. It was impossible not to do that. It was impossible from January 6th to the 20th. I was like, I couldn't do I anything. Know. It was I crazy. Know. But um, but ran a lot, I ran, uh, you know, maybe 100, 110 miles this last month. That's gotta be your biggest month. Biggest month ever running. You're looking for sure. svelte. Hey, thanks, man. I mean, it's zone two, so I'm not that svelte, <laughs> but... Uh, but yeah, so that that's good, and Zoom is doing well, and you know, my wife wants to buy a house, so mm. you know, we're we're I'm growing up. You're very late. The, you're living but, the dream, the adult, <laughs> the adult dream, up. right? <laughs> late comer to the adult world. Yeah, and 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 maybe if you weren't so late to GameStop, you could be buying that house right now. Maybe. You know, it's possible. I don't want to. I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> I have some material for GameStop. Yeah, we're so gonna we'll get into on, that. We'll hold on, trust me. Hold, on, hold all materials. Um, yeah. Cool. 
Well, uh, this is my first podcast uh, after taking essentially an entire month off. Yeah. I went to Hawaii. Yes. Like, what? How are you? Like, that's. I'm a, good. Yeah. I feel really good. I feel refreshed. I feel energized. It was certainly needed. I, I wouldn't say I was teetering on burnout, but I definitely needed a break. I've been grinding the entire year without taking any time off whatsoever. Wow. Um, you so, get like one day off a week generally not or even, not even? I, I pretty much work every, I mean, every once in a while I'll take a day off and I do like, they'll be they'll be like in the middle of the week, pre pandemic, I would like go to a matinee or like just right. take little mini breaks. Um, and in the weekends I work less, but the show goes up every Sunday night. So typically there's a scramble on Sunday afternoon to kind of do last minute tweaks on the show to get it up. So I feel like I'm always kind of working. So one of the, goals, I'll get into my break, but one of the goals for this year is to really utilize um, this new studio and the manpower that we have now to systematize and make things more efficient and create you know, a little bit more uh, bandwidth for intermittent rest yeah. throughout the year and the weeks. But yeah, I took a month off. Uh, I started this the year before I went to Australia for the month of December. This year, I decided to go to Hawaii for January. Um, Solo or and, did you bring the family? Well, Mathis went with me for a week. She had a friend that she was with. She went back and then I was solo the whole time and it was fantastic. When's the last time On the big been island. that way? <laughs> um, first, I will say I got tested a lot of times. So I did it safely. Hawaii has things pretty dialed in. If you go to Kauai, you gotta, you gotta quarantine for 14 days, but on the other islands, they require that you get a test within 72 hours. You gotta fill out all this paperwork. You get a QR code. Uh, when you land in the airport, you got to show them all the paperwork. They scan your QR code and they test you in the airport mm. before you can even get a baggage claim. Right. So they have it. If you're on an island, you can control things a little bit better. Yeah. And the case incidence on the big island was very low. It was something like 10 to 30 a day. Uh, and people were wearing masks everywhere you went, if you went inside somewhere. But overall, it felt much safer to be there. I'm sure. And I was just in... You mean safer own, than the hot zone on uh, of Los Angeles? Yeah, I got <laughs> yeah, I got out of safer. LA, and it was good. You know, I just I just took care of myself and and you know, rented a bike and rode and ran and swam in the ocean, swam with dolphins, which was incredible. I had you just one rented like a high end bike from a good bike shop. I did. There's a there's a shop called Bike Works in Kona, and I have a good relationship with them because I've spent so much time there and raced there so many times. So Grant who owns Bike Works as a friend and he hooked me up with a super sweet ride. That's cool. So that was great. And just went out of my way to not create an agenda for myself. Like I have friends there and I saw a couple of friends, but I tried to not commit myself to anything and to double down, like to go out of my way to not work, which is its own kind of effort, I right. suppose yeah, for me. Effort, right? And I do want to highlight like swimming with dolphins. I've been swim I've been open water swimming like my whole life, never had the experience of swimming with dolphins. Never. And I just was out off the Kailua Pier where they do the Ironman swim and found myself in a pod of like 40 to 50 dolphins. It was like unbelievable. Were they spinners? The were they spinning thing. around? They weren't, they were, I didn't see a lot of spinning, but they were like at all depths Amazing. and just playing with each other and surfacing. Uh, and it was just the coolest thing. That is the coolest So that thing. experience alone was, made the whole thing worth it. That, but, that, the Kona Coast is known for that, right? Cause they have Hona yeah. now, which is two step where the free divers go just uh, past Co Captain Cook. If you go South from Kona. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they know known, they're Cook, known yeah. to have spinners around. Um, Voices in the Ocean, that Susan Casey book, which is about right. dolphins. She did, there's a woman who works out of Kona and does these charters where people go and she, and like, it's very controversial in Kona. Like not every diver likes this woman, I forget her name, but like she takes these people out to swim with dolphins off boats and like, she has people like sing, like she she talks to the dolphins and sings like dolphin songs when the <laughs> dolphins come or something. Oh, wow. And I saw one of her acolyte, not in a bad way, like one of her disciples, I guess, in Hona now once and she, I'll, I remember April and I had just gotten in not too long ago. I was, I was out there for, for work and this woman is like singing in the water. And I'm like, what's she doing? At first she like, like she seemed a little kooky, the snorkeler just singing like dolphin songs or whatever, or squeaking. <laughs> And uh -huh. um, all of a sudden the dolphins came right to her. So I just stuck with her, you know, I stuck with this, uh, you know, eccentric, Dolphin well, singer. why is she controversial? That just sounds cool. It's controversial because some people just are haters. 
You know, mm-hmm. it is cool. Right. Right. Like, but some people are haters and they think like, oh, you know, they don't believe it. And, you know, there's like, you got to read Voices in the Ocean. She like, you know, there, there is a spiritual side to it. Mm-hmm. There is like a whole thing beyond just like, right. hey, it's cool to swim with dolphins. But, right. Um, right. But yeah, there's a hater aspect to it around there. But it's mostly I've found like the women who are free divers there, they like it. They like the woman, they like the people. And the men are the ones that are dismissive. <laughs> That's not shocking. No. <laughs> right. Who's the free diver instructor, coach guy that I texted you about who was doing a course in Kona? And Kurt kind of, Chambers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So my friend, Anthony Irvin, who's in Oahu or was at the time, I think he still is, um, I think did, did something with him and alerted me to this guy. And I was tempted to take the guy's course. But then I was like, I just, I really just need to rest and yeah, not yeah. do anything. So I opted out of that. But Yeah, Kurt broke Nick Mavoli's American record. I mm. think he might still hold it or you held it for a while as the deepest American ever. Wow. And free diving over a hundred meters. He competed at Team USA. He's in one breath in a, in a kind of just an aside. Mm. Interesting guy, great, great photographer and a very prolific teacher out there. Right, he has a cool Instagram too. Yeah, very cool. Oh. Chambers Below. Yeah, yeah, At yeah. Chambers Below. Yeah. Yeah. But the upshot is I'm back. I feel energized. I feel fit. I've got good momentum with my fitness. I'm excited about 2021. I do want to take a moment to welcome Jason Camiolo yes. to to the studio. Jason, for people that have been on this podcast journey with us for a while, know him as the audio engineer slash producer slash guy who takes care of all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. He had always been living in the Phoenix area and all of our work was remotely performed. And now he has moved to Los Angeles and he's here full time manning all the dials right now. So welcome, Jason, we're excited to have you and it's gonna be an amazing year. So I'm pumped. Can I ask you one more question about Hawaii? Yeah. Were you getting uh, Ironman pangs, like being on the terrain? I mean, you're basically riding and running and swimming similar terrain. Is it? Yeah, but I've spent so much time on the big island, like for me, it's not that exotic to go there because I've because I, I have logged so many hours training there and yeah. just like living there basically. So it's more like a feeling of coming home. Like it's mm-hmm. nice to ride on the Queen K and I got off the beaten track and did some other rides and tried to explore other aspects of the island that I'm less familiar with. But it's very like comfortable for me to just kind of go there and it just it doesn't feel like vacation. It just feels like another place that I've lived in the past. Yeah. So how is the water? So good. 76, 78. Yeah. And there were whales breaching. I, yeah, I, I was in a condo for half the time and then on this beautiful house uh, on the water in, in a little neighborhood called Puaco, which is a pretty cool area. Is that north and of Kona or south? It's north. Uh, it's just south of Hapuna Beach okay. um, and Kauai High, if you know where that yeah. is. So right right, kind of a couple miles before the, the Kauai High turn, if you, know, if you know the island at all. But it's, it's, it's this little like hidden neighborhood with all these beautiful homes right on the water and Fantastic. whales breaching off the, it was crazy. So, so you didn't leave. Yeah, <laughs> but part of the goal was to, you know, be off digital devices and, you know, really live an analog life, but the world exploded. And yes. like yourself, I found myself doom scrolling and I could not detach <laughs> myself from the news cycle, which seemed to be just, you know, getting crazier, uh, you know, by the second, which oh, yeah. is what we're gonna get into it, right it, now. It went crazy, it went goofier than anyone even thought. Like you could say that about the entire presidency of the last four years, it went goofier than we ever thought, but like the, the end, <laughs> it was like a, it was like, a fireworks, uh, you know, when they have a fireworks show, it was like the finale to the fireworks show. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, right? <laughs> so, uh, shall we now just dispel the idea that somehow 2021 might normalize, <laughs> that everything is gonna get, kind of settle into place. Uh, instead, we give you insurrection, game stonk, Jewish lasers, and who knows what else. And who knows what else. So let's take a quick break. And when we come back, uh, we'll be joined by Giorgio and Arthur. All right, and we're back with the boys. <laughs> Four in here. the yeah. house. We got Arthur, we got Giorgio. I'm disappointed, Giorgio, though. I was told that you were gonna dress up today as the QAnon shaman. Yeah, oh, I had my Didn't top happen. down on my convertible. And the, Didn't happen? The helmet flew off. Yeah. <laughs> the Viking, the Viking horns. horns. <laughs> right. Somewhere yeah. on the 101 right now, so. 
You know, um, say what you want about the QAnon shaman, but it, at least he eats organic. He's organic, right? Wasn't <laughs> he on true. a food strike <laughs> yes, when he was yes, yes, incarcerated? Yes. Yeah, was What's yeah. the latest update on that guy? Well, there was a there was a fake news. So the na- a friend of mine uh, sent me a National Post article, which is some bullshit tabloid from Canada that tried to claim that the judge actually gave it to him, gave him organic food. And it, that started proliferating through uh, social media and outraging people. You know, how could he get this special treatment? They would never treat a POC that way, blah, blah, blah. But it turns out he didn't get it. Wasn't it wasn't true. No. Yeah. yeah. I think but, he's he's agreed to to be deposed on, in Congress and like speak against, I guess, presumably Trump or who else, like speak to the mm, movement. Wow. So that should be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> sure. He'll take it. He'll take an invitation to a microphone in <laughs> exactly. Congress. Exactly. <laughs> <No kidding. laughs> right. I, he'd been building his brand for a while. Like, I mean, he'd been showing up to all the Save Your Children rallies for for months before the, the capital. I mean, he kind of is the face of the whole thing on some level. He ha- this has to be going exactly as he hoped it would, I would imagine. Perhaps, until he ends up behind bars, I suppose. Let's I don't hope. know if he well, I don't know if his lawyer, on that aspect. His lawyer is ahead of that. You know, his lawyer said, you know, he's not a bad person. He's a practitioner of yoga. Mm. That was one of the early defense no, lines. Amazing. I swear to God, wow. <laughs> just like yeah. the Beakram guy, right? Well, it feels it feels a little bit. <laughs> yeah, Beakram's also practicing yoga. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he is. Um, it feels a little bit weird and dated to like talk about the Capitol insurrection because it feels like it's a hundred years ago. Yeah. Could you could you have imagined when that was going on that you know a month later it would feel like old news in comparison to some of the things that are happening now? It's just crazy, right? I do think we need to like track it a little bit. Yeah. But what I wanted you guys here for is to help us understand or like decode, you know, how we move from Pepe the Frog, how that becomes QAnon, how that leads to the insurrection and the interrelation p- between that or the interplay between that and kind of what we're seeing right now with GameStop and the gamification of Wall Street. I mean, it's insane. It is insane, but it yeah, is Yeah, that's all a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> right, yeah. I know. No, it's true. There's that amazing meme of um, it's 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 a, someone standing in front of a uh, a line of dominoes, and the first domino is very small, and the last domino is very huge. And the the beginning push of the domino on the small domino is basically Gamergate, and then the final one right. is all of the COVID deaths. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Elon, this is all Elon kind Musk of connected. tweeted that that graphic, right? Oh, yeah. Oops. Yeah. yeah, but basically, <laughs> he's somewhere like, in the middle of that. Yeah, yeah I was gonna yeah, say. Yeah. Like, well, he's a player right yeah, now. Right. Like, Absolutely, he's, he's, he's basically you know front and center in terms of which memes get traction and which don't. He's a merchant of chaos at this yeah. point. Yeah, but chaos sure. is a good place to start. Like, where were you all? Where were you guys? Like, Rich, like when when it started happening and the riots broke out. I mean, I think you, we got we should start there. Like. What, where were you? What were you guys thinking? I mean, I was in Hawaii yeah. trying to be off the computer and off my phone, and I just could not stop. Were you getting scrolling. texts first, or were you like, how how did you find no, out? No, I mean, about I it? would, you know, I would check in. It wasn't like I was trying to be completely off the phone, but you know, I would look at Twitter, and then you know, you'd see the news, and you're like, I, I have to understand what's happening. Like, I just could not put distance between myself and the device. It was just so compelling, yeah. and and strange and interesting and disheartening and unbelievable, like yeah. every adjective under the hood. Yeah. Yeah, the, the guy uh, in our film, Joel, who is part of the network contagion, wait, what's that? I can't remember the, the acronym. And um, I don't remember. I mean, he works out of Princeton and yeah. he, has a, he has a consortium of people called iDrama Lab. iDrama. And they had been sort of modeling um, behavior on all of these different platforms. And so a lot of this stuff I think was predictable by the academics that followed it. And it was also predictable because this notion of stop the steal, specifically like in when Trump addressed the crowd, he talked about stop the steal and he's like, this is something you came up with. But the reality of stop the steal is that started in 2016. That was something mm-hmm. that was uh, something that Roger Stone came up with. Mm-hmm. Um, Before he, the election? Yeah, oh, yeah. They, well, they assumed I think a lot of people assumed that the race with Hillary Clinton was gonna be very close. And so they were already sort of seeding this notion of stop the steal that early to the point where Stone bought the URL. Hmm. And so this idea that this was like an organic groundswell is ridiculous. Stop the steal was also used sort of in the midterms. So they're just kind of pulling on the same thread that's been there for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't think anyone could have predicted that the Capitol Police response would have been so lax, but Hmm. I think, 
this was a, a moment of coalition building where they had all of the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the, all the QAnon people, people, all the Christian fundamentalists, the, the white supremacists, all sort of merging around this one thing. And, you know, in the weeks before, you know, we can't forget that all of these people were coming to different state capitals and showing right. up in real life mm -hmm. as well. So, and it was the day that they were supposed to certify, right? So it was everything was kind of they were they we knew they were all going there. That's why we were all tuned in to begin with. Like it wasn't like I wasn't going to watch the news that day anyway, right? So it was almost like plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> but but the inauguration was meant to be the ultimate moment in QAnon history, right? right? It right. was all supposed to go down at that moment. So there was a lot of energy and anticipation right. that was circling Gen around six, all of that. And in terms of the Capitol Police response, like in the wake of what transpired, you saw all of these internet sleuths sharing screen grabs from 4chan. And it's like anybody who spent any time or, or exerted any due diligence leading up to the inauguration could have easily discovered that this was, you know, a possibility or, or more, more likely than not, like a plausibility. And so where is, like, where was the, where does the fault get levied in terms of that anemic, you know, kind of response. I think, the cops. Yeah. I, I think mean, that I think, remains to be seen. Yeah. I mean, they haven't released surveil surveillance there, today. Footage. Today, yeah. something came out because tomorrow, I guess the impeachment proceedings be or yeah. this, the trial begins. Right. And, and, he, so and all his lawyers quit, right? Yeah. Because yeah. He, he wants <laughs> to maintain the, the stop the steal argument and right. they just can't abide by that. So now he's got these new They don't lawyers. want to lose their, <laughs> their standing in the <laughs> yeah. bar. So Don Winslow tweeted out a letter that looks looked accurate to me, but it was from Christopher Miller, the the defense secretary, because they or the army secretary. Someone else had just left that post, and he got put in as the acting secretary. Mm -hmm. And in this letter, it basically said it was based. It was before January six. It was before January fourth. There had been requests to have national guard on standby, and in this letter, he basically is saying. You can't have any of that on standby. You need to clear everything through me or nothing happens at all. Mm -hmm. And so now there is a paper trail. So that's the first thing that dropped. And that just happened right before I got here today Jesus. on Twitter. No, so if you look on that. Don Winslow's Twitter, you know, right. the guy that wrote the cartel yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, yeah, I mean, that's so Joel from our film reached out to me like a year ago and has, he's been researching Q this whole time. And he basically told me that a, a year ago at, that at that stage, like, um, that QAnon was essentially like fully operational at this point. And what the thing that was very concerning from his perspective was that it was kind of the first time that there's a leaderless movement like this. And that it kind of was, um, that it was kind of uh, irrelevant whether or not people discovered who Q himself or herself was at that point, because it was like this self aggregating, self motivated machine. And that's like what the capital insurrection sort of proved out because at that point, Q hadn't really spoken right. at that point in like a month. Mm. And um, yeah, where we go from here, who knows, but. Well, what was important though, was that the Q prophecy was actualized and that <laughs> mm -hmm. certainly yes. did not come to pass. No. So this bubble gets popped and then you have a fracture in that community. You have the hardcores who are still reconfiguring the narrative to say, well, because of this and this, like it's still a thing. And then you have, a whole other larger fraction of that population coming to their senses. And now we're seeing like, did you see the Anderson Cooper interview with the former QAnon guy who had to apologize to him mm -hmm. for thinking that he ate babies? And yeah. We're seeing you know a lot of that right now, which is kind of encouraging, yeah. I think on some level, um, but it had to be fascinating for you guys who are so steeped in all of this to kind of watch that transpire, mm -hmm. knowing what you guys know about the power of these movements that, you know, for the most part, don't catch the attention of mainstream society. I mean, Adam, you were saying you were you were before the podcast. You were talking about how you were researching voting yeah, uh, for a book hacking. proposal, and yeah. you didn't even you didn't even know anything about. Pepe. I, I didn't know about Pepe. No, I was spending a lot of time in the ocean though in 2016. <laughs> so yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> right down the street from my house. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I I wasn't like in. I wasn't on the Q. I wasn't in the four chance because like by then I think we'd had we'd had. Um, I mean, this goes to why it's important to dive into this like 
darker kind of murky shitty stuff right as as awake human mm -hmm. beings it's great that you're talking about this because you'd think like when you 4chan i always associated with the uc santa barbara mass shooter who um you know these incels and these like these righteous self-righteous incels and i just like i don't want anything to do with that so i i kind of tune that stuff out so when i when i'm looking at an election that happened with how trump won I wasn't looking at like 4chan at all. It wasn't even on my radar. My radar was like, how could, I was thinking way analog. I was right. like- Gerrymandering. I, you know, I'm not a gamer. I'm not packs. into that world. So I wasn't thinking like that at all. So to, which is why I love the movie so much because it kind of wakes you up. And, and it, this shows like if we'd been tuned in, if the Republican party had been tuned in, maybe like if anybody had been tuned in, um, it could have been stopped. But maybe it couldn't have been, you know, maybe it was like the, when you have a groundswell like this, there's not, there's nothing that can stop it. I don't know. I don't know that they were necessarily against. Stopping. I was going to say, I think they were tuned in. I think they chose to ignore it. Yeah. And I think there's evidence of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we've, we've been in contact with this Republican Congressman, Denver Riggleman, who is the, the one sort of voice in the wilderness, the one Republican that spoke out against Q over the summer. And he claims that he was basically chastised by the rest of the party. They told him to stop talking about Q because they felt like that was their margin in certain states. Mm. And so, um, you know, he he tweeted out and said that, you know, Q, there was no coincidence that Q had the same number of letters as Moron. QAnon. Uh, QAnon, <laughs> QAnon, excuse me. And then also that uh, uh, it's mental gonorrhea. And so, you know, the Republicans, I think, knew this, but they realized that um, it was something that was to their advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and to back up, I mean, it's to the kind of incel shooter aspect of QAnon and sort of the nexus of when these two coalitions, the the 4chan community and like the, the burgeoning Trump movement coincided. In the film, we kind of tease it out, but it, sometimes it just kind of whizzes past people. So it's worth kind of refocusing on it here because it's really central to the, the conversation, but it's like, um, there's a mass shooting in Oregon in 2015. 2015. Yeah. And uh, we don't know for sure, but most likely the shooter himself posted on 4chan uh, a kind of warning that like, don't go to school tomorrow, there's gonna be a shooting. And then at the bottom, mm -hmm. there's a Pepe holding a handgun. And then two weeks later, Donald Trump, who at that point is like a dark horse candidate, posts a meme of himself as like smug Pepe. And for a lot of people, like, first of all, that was the first time that Pepe really made it into the national news was during that shooting, but people didn't really know what it was. He was referred to as a, a Grinch, a sniveling Grinch or something, <laughs> right. something like that. <laughs> right. Yes. But in, then in also, news report. Yeah. And, but then also, like, people didn't really understand the significance of what Trump was tweeting. But in a sense, it was kind of a wink to this collective of online trolls that, that were really the vanguard of, like, hacking the internet at that point, right? Mm -hmm. And like this, mm -hmm. the burgeoning uh, click-based economy, like they really understood, they were very savvy at understanding how to manipulate the flows of media. And so Trump at that moment, under, or well, who knows? If there's one question I would ask Trump, it's like, did you know what you were tweeting at right. that point? But, yeah, the self-awareness around that is is up in the air. Dubious. Totally, totally dubious. But like, you know, Pepe at that point represented something very significant. It was kind of like a, preemptor to the stand back and stand by moment, mm -hmm. right? And so what he really set off was this kind of wink to that community who all shared a similar sort of uh, hatred towards PC culture and, you know, minorities and women. And they all kind of shared the same anger towards the same group of people. And he, those people basically started creating like, uh, of like a meme revolution that helped him kind of buttress this burgeoning movement of online meme lords into like, you know, a actual political movement as older people are starting to join social media and stuff. They start like, oh, what's this funny frog meme? Mm -hmm. You know, this is fun. And you start to realize that like memes are actually really incredible ways to um, like capture the imagination of people and like kind of coalesce around a movement around meme iconography, I guess. So yeah. what's the connection? Where's the link from Pepe, like you were asking right. from Pepe to Q, mm. how, where, when does that happen? When does that start happening? Is there a direct link where they, where one, where Pepe becomes like a Q basically? Well, Pepe, 
in the constellation of <laughs> Q iconography, Pepe is sort of a satellite figure. Um, you know, it is interesting. So Pepe um, became very popular on 4chan, um, and that's where Q started too. Q started out as um, one of many jokes where people on 4chan to be they pretend to be someone they're not, and they post using various sort of aliases. And so people would post often um, on 4chan pretending to have like some sort of government access or secret knowledge. And usually this is sort of all taken as like a LARP or a joke. But um, Q really started off, um, you know, when a group of people, when a, when a sort of cohort of people who were all trying to create their own um, personas very much based on info wars kind of found um, this these Q drops and they started to signal boost them within their YouTube live streams, on Twitter, in these sort of places. And uh, then you started to see Q resonating with a different audience than Pepe resonated with. Mm. Pepe resonated with a younger audience, uh, internet savvy audience, an audience that was like very irony, you know, like very irony poisoned. Q found sort of, uh, an audience of an older generation, most of whom were evangelical Christians. And they were looking for some sort of way in which Trump was going to be part of God's plan, was basically going to be their savior, essentially. And the narrative of Q was that ignore all of the hypocrisy, the corruption, you know, ignore all of that because Trump is actually kind of running a covert deep state sort of espionage sting where he's going to sort of show up triumphant. He's going to maybe kill Hillary Clinton, maybe hang her, maybe imprison her. Different, thing, different people thought different things. And so this was a moment where um, uh, this really like caught wildfire in Facebook groups and it caught wildfire in Twitter. It was another moment where things moved off of 4chan and into the mainstream. And while this was happening, a lot of the old school people that were using Pepe maybe in our film were just laughing. They were like, I can't believe these people believe this stuff. And this is 2017 maybe? Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you started to then see um, the people who were Q adherents really got kind of addicted to the same sort of like online behavior that a lot of the 4chan um, people were kind of, you know, you know, it's the same stuff that was um, the shut-in culture of 4chan, the people that were spending all their time online. This was now happening with a slightly older generation and they were following themselves. They were going down a rabbit hole. They would call themselves white rabbits or they would say, follow the white rabbit. Mm. And it was this willful kind of crazy making um, where it was exciting and fun to feel like you were part of this other movement. And while this was happening, this is fitting into like biblical revelation. It's fitting into right. a lot of other sort of presumed prophecy that people are already thinking about. And, and just a general good versus evil, right? Yeah, the that, revelation parallel I think is pretty powerful. Like it was yes. all gonna culminate in yeah. this reckoning. Right. And where Trump the 5D is, chess maneuvers yeah. were gonna come to play and everything was gonna change. Yeah. And Trump represents this really great kind of imperfect hero, right? Which I think is like very familiar kind of character within evangelical community, right? Like you kind of explain away the fact that he's been married three times and he's a pathological liar. He's like an imperfect person under the light of Christ or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, mm. and he's viewed as a protect a protector. Yeah, exactly. you know, I mean, he delivered the su Supreme Court nominations. You know, one third of the Supreme Court now is you know, oops, yeah, is is now <laughs> Trump appointees. There were certain things that he was doing that were really viewed as um, he was a protector of Christian America. Um, whether and they white, knew he was white, imperfect white Christian, Christian America, America, right? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, for single issue issue voters, where it's all about pro-life, um, it's much easier for them to overlook all the other indiscretions because he's taking care of that issue for them. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course COVID happens and then just hypercharges all of this because now you can't leave your house and you're stuck inside your computer and like the funnel, you know, just gets tighter. But that's, ca that's kerosene. The funnel gets tighter, on, but the on, mouth is wider. That's yes. kerosene on the community aspect of this, which I think is super important, yeah. whether it's 4chan and Pepe or Facebook groups and, and QAnon, it gave these people something to engage with and created like a really robust community that that provided a sense of belonging, that gamified the mm -hmm. whole thing. And on some level, I suppose, was addictive and just too compelling to not walk away from. It was well, extremely addictive. I mean, yeah. 
there's an alienation problem in America, mm. I think for a lot of people mm. that pre-existed COVID, right? We are a culture that spends more time commuting than any other culture in our cars by ourselves, you know, like uh, in my, the, the, the film we worked on together, the previous film was about housing and like one of the central points of central data points that really fascinated me that got me into the making of the film was the idea that 60 years ago, the average size of the family was three and a half people and the average size of the home was 900 square feet. And today it's two and a half people and it's almost 3000 square mm -hmm. feet. Mm -hmm. So we have like fewer people inhabiting more space. And like, there's just something inherently uh, distressing and alienating about that. And I think like QAnon just kind of exacerbates all these problems and, and then COVID layers on top of it. And all of a sudden you feel like you're part of a community uh, solving this global cabal of, you know, pedophiles. And it like, um, it becomes inescapable, the seduction. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think in addition to the alienation and the disconnection that so many people experience, it also gave a lot of moralist people a sense of purpose, right? Yeah. Like I'm thinking of Cleet Keller, you know, he got a lot of yeah. attention, the Olympic swimmer mm. who showed up in the rotunda. I don't know him personally, but I have lots of friends that that do know him well. And this is a guy who excelled at the highest level in his sport, went mm -hmm. to multiple Olympiads, medaled like a huge athletic champion. And then in the wake of retiring, hit like some really tough experiences. He got divorced, he lost custody of his kids. At one point for an extended period of time, he was homeless living in his car. He could not that. find his his groove with his career and he couldn't supplant the sense of purpose that he found in swimming in other areas of his life. And in so many ways, he's almost like the perfect test case mm. for somebody who's gonna be susceptible to these kinds of ideas. Like I, I, I tweeted about him being um, kind of the, uh, the convergence of Kevin Roos's rabbit hole podcast series with the Weight of Gold HBO documentary. Like he experienced what so many Olympians experience when they retire, they have mental health issues, they have depression, they can't figure out what to do with their lives, meets, you know, QAnon or these other ideas. Uh, and then there you go down the rabbit hole. And he shows up in the rotunda and thinks it's a good idea to be wearing his Olympic jacket, right. <laughs> you know, at the time. So what is the mentality of somebody like that? And I'm trying, when I look at that, I'm trying to look at it from a perspective of compassion right. and curiosity. Like I wanna right. understand what led him to that place rather than just vilify him. No, like, yeah. like there, there's yeah. something, obviously there's a huge mental health component that we're touching on here, the alienation, you know, the, the this specific case, but everybody there was part of this who, who decided to enter the rotunda, rotunda, whether they planned to, in advance, which it, there's certainly evidence that a lot, some of them did. I mean, a lot of them did, mm -hmm. and then, or whether they just happened to get caught up. There's something about this, a performative attempt to create an alternate reality that you are starring in. Mm -hmm. And whether, you know, you see people streaming Agency. themselves, Cleet is wearing his outfit. That, so you knew the QAnon shaman made sure you knew who he was. Mm -hmm. People are like, you know, the, Darren, what's his face? <laughs> it's <laughs> Darren's in the rotunda, you know, the, the guy yeah, from yeah. West Virginia. There is something about a pride to be a part of this kind of uh, rea alternate reality that they managed to create together where anything could have happened. I mean, like really anything could have happened. Like if they had run into AOC or Pelosi or yeah. Pence, there, there would have been bloodshed for sure. Um, but any, but in reality, it was just people milling around and doing kind of just vandalizing is what right. ended up happening. But fueled by a sense of righteousness. Fueled That's by why this, right. they were so brazen about right. taking the selfies and live streaming it because in their minds, they were doing the right thing. And, the, at and the that behest Trump would of protect them. Trump yes, and yes, Cruz yes, and all these other yeah. people who yeah. in their minds had discharged them for this purpose. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was listening to a podcast recently called Design Matters and uh, Marina Abramovich was on mm. and she was talking about her piece in 1974, this famous performance art piece that she did in Naples, um, which maybe you've heard about, but like she basically erected the stage and laid out a bunch of different things in front of her and basically invited the audience to do whatever they wanted to her. There was no rules, but the only agreement was that you were coming up on stage, so you were part of the performance. Mm -hmm. And it went on for six hours and I'd, I'd heard, you know, descriptions of the performance before, but I'd never heard it from her perspective. 
And what was really striking to me was like her description of what happened afterwards, because during the performance, things escalated like very quickly. And, you know, she was fearful that she was going to get raped. A guy at a certain point picked up the the revolver that was on the thing and put it up to her head and someone intervened and pulled it out of his hand. And she got cut on the neck and someone like sucked the blood out of her neck. <laughs> and then she said uh, that at a moment where she thought she was going to get raped, women in the audience were yelling at the men on stage to do something to her, like something terrible. But so after the performance concluded, she walked out into the audience and no one could look at her in the eye. Everyone was so ashamed at what they wow. had done. And I was like, that is the capital insurrection. It's, right? it's like the shock treatment or, test. That or famous shock or treatment it's, test. Yeah. it's the Stanford prison experiment. Yeah, yeah. 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 Trump exactly. gave them, yeah, yeah, Trump gave them the permission. And you hear it now when like, after these people were arrested, they're like, well, Trump said I could do it. Right. And like, like that is a really sheer, powerful- Yeah, the sheer incredulity that yeah. they would be held to account for these actions. Like the surprise, like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Why is the FBI calling me? Exactly. Like confusion. What, what, the guy yeah. crying in the on the airport terminal because he got, uh, he was already All right, on the no fly. He got on the no fly list. Yeah, that but was the thing is Trump didn't specifically say they could do that. And so like, I, I'm, not, I'm not defending but, him, but, but, yeah, I'm, not yeah. defending but him. I'm not defending him. But the whole culture is about but, cryptic drops, right? right? Yes. Where you have to read Decipher. the tea leaves. And, yeah. yes, and There's a reason he's the yourself. best con man yeah. in history. He knows what not to say and how to say what he's not saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and get off right. scot-free every time. You're right. right. Yeah, it's, it's wild. I mean, Q, Q sort of now, I think, doesn't necessarily represent sort of the adrenochrome and the baby blood and all that sort yeah. of stuff anymore. Now it's just basically you're signaling to the world that you have some sort of a spiritual war against the deep state, mm. that you are a person who feels as though um, you are working on behalf of divinity in some way. And so over the summer, it went from the evangelicals to kind of a new age crowd. And within that new age ca- crowd, it was a lot of influencers as well. Q initially was a lot of people alone in their Facebook groups trading Q drops. And then over the summer, it really moved into a street movement. And it had like a slight, it had a different um, group of people who were attached to it at that point. And I think a lot of those people who were in the rotunda um, started from those sort of protests that were happening during the summer, the anti-lockdown protests, yeah. those sort of protests. And people were oblivious to their own sedition at that point. They did not understand what they were doing. They couldn't define sedition if you asked them to, <laughs> most of these people. I mean, no. let's not, let's not be yeah. super nice. Like there are some morons in this group. Like For there's sure. some real idiots. I mean, they're For not sure. bright. And some know. truly evil people do. Right. I mean, yeah. you, you can't yeah. undercount the fact that they're amongst the group of clueless, like just sort of live streaming. <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't a monolith. Like right. you had yeah. there were actual heads who stumbled in there yeah, accidentally right. and just thought it was like a frat party. And then you have, the highly trained, you know, super militarized group of people who are wearing earpieces and have zip ties and and look like they're in military formation going yep. into the Capitol. Like those are two different types of people. And then there's just like the baby boomers that are like thought it'd be fun to go to a protest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? I mean, like seriously, 60s, man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I yeah. I mean, I have some friends who's who found out afterwards that their parents were there. They weren't like That's part crazy. of the siege, but they were there and then they left before things went really bananas. Or so, or so right. they say. Yeah, or so they say. And they went to the Hyatt Regency and had a Chardonnay, you know, yeah. in the lobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess the larger issue is, you know, like I have a bunch of family who are very conservative and they would sort of watch the Capitol riots with a lot of the same sort of surprise and revulsion that maybe we would, but ultimately they're sympathetic because they do feel like the election was stolen. They do feel like that Biden doesn't have a mandate from the people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know what you kind of do with that thinking. That right. seems so, like the so, larger issue. So when in, in, in the settling of the dust, are we in a situation in which there's a calcification mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, like a doubling down on these ideas by a certain subset of this group or, is there a moment of awakening happening where people are just kind of coming to their senses? Like, what is your, how, you know, how do you take the temperature right now on the culture in terms of what that produced and what will happen next? I mean, I, for me personally, I think it just has to come from accountability. I think the Republicans are still, you know, for like a day after that, there's there was like just like little breadcrumbs of that they were offering up to the public of for like, a, I don't know, uh, like recognition that this was maybe had mm-hmm. gone a little bit too far, but that 
was immediately erased like the next day. And now they're saying like, oh, let's just get over this. So you, why are you going to, why are you going to impeach the president? He's just a private citizen now. So like the reality is, is that the Republican party has always been a party of trolls. And like now it's just only intensified and they can't sort of relinquish that power because to do that is to admit that they're actually not interested in governing, Mm -hmm. right? Like they want all of the power of being in office, but they don't want any of the responsibilities. It's much better to just like keep uh, people voting for them just based off of fear and anger rather than like offering um, material solutions to people's problems. And so until the Republicans decide to like throw out, you know, Ted Cruz out of Congress, I don't know that that's ever yeah, I mean, there was a sense in the immediate aftermath that there was a coming to the senses and yeah. some rationality being injected into the GOP. Sure, and perhaps this whole thing could be stabilized. But as of late, most of the news is about Josh Hawley and about Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and this extreme faction that that you know is a magnet for all the attention and press. Yeah, I mean, I think it's ultimately going to play out on social media and we don't know kind of how that's going to play out um, in part because there's been these mass bans and, you know, the data scientists we talk to um, in the course of making Feels Good Man all sort of talk about how um, whenever there's a massive deplatforming, there is some sort of reactionary response. Mm -hmm. Don't know exactly what it is, but um, that is going to happen. Um, there's a lot of people who I think feel a real sense of like loss without the ability to hear from Trump constantly. There is a weird there, vacuum. There is a there's a vacuum, and I think that's happening in it's the left strange. too. Like even yeah, yeah. I'm like just let him tweet for five minutes. Like, totally. I don't hear what he, you know. Yeah. No, no, no. The, no. the, the so dog needs to him. hunt. No. Yeah, but there was no. that stat that, do that. that after yeah. Trump was was deplatformed, that that there was a seventy percent drop in all of the kind of hate speech that surrounds all oh, yeah. of this. Like it, yeah. it, it was impactful for that it was a great. It was a great move. I mean, it should have And then you have before. the migration to Parler and everything that happened and with Parler. And Parler got the plug. Well, so, so I think that, that yeah. you know, you, you, I think that it was more than just, um, just for a couple of days. There are a couple of significant things have happened, right? So one is uh, Twitter deplatformed all these people. Parler got the plug pulled. Um, you know, they, they'll probably get back up at some point if they're not yet, but at I some think, point- Are they getting Russian money or yeah, something or like that to yeah. be back up and running? Yeah. Are they back up and running now? Not that I know of, but I, I didn't check mm-hmm. today. Um, but then the corporate America stepped in as the as like the moderator of the political world after being the, mm-hmm. the people that pumped the money in and made it kind of yeah. created these conditions. All of a sudden corporate America is like, well, we're, we're keeping track of who's saying what and we're suspending our donations, which is why I think- McConnell was originally again, you know, very vocal anti-Trump. Why you had that change and in, in, in right. Lynn Cheney speaking out? That had to be part of the consensus or part of the um, the math. But I've always thought because the numbers are on the side of still, they are the numbers are still on the side of of people who want to create a workable country. They still are, and uh, we've had six thousand people in the last few weeks, leave the Republican party in North Carolina, 10,000 in Pennsylvania. Now, if you've been watching these elections, that's enough to swing an election. Mm -hmm. Um, 5,000 in Colorado, 5,000 in Arizona. Those are concrete numbers that are reported by Colorado Public Radio today. I sent you that that Mm -hmm. link, we can link to it. Um, That's significant. And all we've ever needed is five to 10% of the leadership in the Republican party and the Democratic party the re- the rest of the Democratic Party to kind of agree on certain things, like to be able to deal with climate change and loss of biodiversity and healthcare and 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 um, racial justice and 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 uh, criminal justice reform, and that stuff's out there, like that's possible. So it, it is possible that the radical right have succeeded in creating a consensus uh, that never that did not exist before. It is possible that the breaking of the glass is the breaking of the problem. Mm. It is possible. Now, we'll we'll see. You know, like right. obviously that's admittedly a very optimistic <laughs> viewpoint on where things are going, but you know, the Senate right now as you know, by the time this airs, it may be old news, but today was kind of I trying to guarantee that it will be old news <laughs> yeah. the way that But like they're they're trying the to work with Biden works. like there's five yeah. or 10 senators who are trying to work with Biden on a plan to deal with pandemic aid. Um so there is, there does seem to be still possible 
uh, the building of a consensus of people who are not living in that alternate reality in that magical yeah. land, in that fever dream. I mean, I, I, on the I subject right. of deplatforming, because I just you know, I wanted to make this point. I mean, I I think I think deplatforming Trump was an easy call in light of everything, and should have happened much earlier than it did. So, as late as it was, I still applaud Jack and Twitter for for yeah. taking that action. Uh, but I also think that there is an interesting conversation to be had about the powers that are now held by these mm -hmm. gigantic tech conglomerates and the stack that supports these platforms. When AWS pulls the plug on Parler, we can applaud that because Parler's such a shit show or whatever, but let's step, <laughs> take a step back and look at what that actually means. And when that much power is vested in one organization, it's not just the platform. It's like these platforms need all of these other things in order to exist. Yep. How does that play out when there's a paradigm shift in the powers that be? Good yeah. question. It's very I good mean, point. I think yeah. Facebook seems to be a, doing a marketing move right now where they're basically asking for regulation. They're like welcoming it. Like we're we're ready to be regulated. And it feels like they're just kicking the can down the road because it's not something that they necessarily want to instigate internally. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think it's also important to point out that Parler wasn't sort of a um, passive takedown. It was actually a group of like first generation hackers who came in and basically showed all these security breaches, caused yeah. a lot of havoc on the back right. end. Yeah. Like they downloaded the entire yeah. app, right? right. Like they made everything a million that's ever different been posted, moderators. And deleted yeah. posts yeah. are all yeah. now on a hard drive uh -huh. somewhere. Yeah. And, and that was and that helped the FBI find a lot of these right. people, yeah. right? And a lot of that group was like first generation anonymous. People the who actually were, the real the, the, the hacker collective anonymous. Yeah, wow, I didn't yeah. realize that. And mm -hmm. they and in part they were mad just because Q Anonymous was stealing kind of their branding. Right. And um, so it came from the internet before corporations came right. in and did their due diligence. That's super interesting. So I didn't know that. I don't Are you know connected about, to the anonymous guys? Oh man. <laughs> but the, oh, uh, oh we film okay. too. But I <laughs> no, but I, it's out there too. If yeah. you, it's yeah. it's all out there in the public record if yeah. you want to look for yeah. it. But I do think that um, you know Dorsey has been sort of acting like a moderator, but the reality is, I mean, he made a lot of money off of Trump. There was a lot of friction caused on his platform. A lot of people spent time on it. It's where QAnon really became like a place of radicalization yeah. was in Twitter as these drops would sort of come in mm. and speed along the agenda of Q. Um, I don't know. It seems like he needs to start acting like a CEO and not like, you know, I, I don't know. A, passive. A, a passive resident. moderator yeah. sitting on the beach mm -hmm. waiting for his employees to come and tell him to do something, which is what was happening. It's also in terms of the, the broader conversation and the ethical conversation about deplatforming, it's also important, I think, to understand that there's basically like two co cohorts to the conversation. There's like the general user who is maybe fearful for whatever reason of, of losing their several hundred followers, but then there's like the opportunist, right? Like you have to be wary of the bad faith argument that's often made during these conversations by people like Alex Jones, who wrap deplatforming in this first amendment argument, right. which is mm -hmm. of course completely specious bullshit. Right. Because uh, for them, it is an existential crisis for them. If you are a grifter, like, and I mentioned this before in our last conversation, but I think it bears mentioning like, before the internet, like you'd have to print pamphlets and open up a fake church and like really do the work to bring in people into your flock and like convince them to give you their money. And then social media came out and just basically like, if you want to be a grifter, it's like, it's a gold rush, right? right? Not only is it easier to find people, but people will put in their own bios, like, please take my money, like hashtag Q, you know, mm. where we go on, where we, where we go when we go all like, you're basically advertising to the sheep. I mean, as a sheep to the wolves, like, please, take advantage of me. And so like in these conversations about deplatforming, the most vocal people are often the ones who stand the most to gain from like being able to, to be trolls online. And the most to lose should they be de exactly. deplatformed. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do we, cre on, this, on this theme of like creating some kind of narrative through line from Pepe to present, <laughs> yeah. oh, right. the point tracking of the this through Q, <laughs> like now we have, you know, we've got, we've got Josh Hawley, we've got Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene, yeah. we got Lauren Boebert, we got, you know, the Jewish space lasers. And now we have, now we have GameStop, right? Mm. Like, is there like, have you kind of forensically tracked how we have gone in lockstep through these various phases? 
I mean, Pepe. I mean, GameStop seems the most similar to the early days of Pepe. Totally. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Rating. Like, that's basically a big part of 4chan is about rating. And like, that's the most, uh, rating is basically the idea of like getting all your online friends to go and focus their energies on doing like one, one thing. thing. Hmm. Um, and affecting reality. And affecting yeah. reality. And Pepe essentially, all you have to really think about in terms of Pepe's relationship to all this is that for a long time, Pepe was just the icon for trolling, the icon for that kind of um, duplicitous online uh, maneuvering, <laughs> mischief, <laughs> making. mischief making. Yeah. yeah. So, but there's a glee, and yes. you know that comes with this collective energy. Like, totally. oh my God, we're all on the same page, and right. we're all we're going to actually move culture through our keystrokes. Yes, and that's so intoxicating. Yeah, yeah. Especially I, if you're, you know, in your mom's basement, <laughs> and it's a pandemic, and you <laughs> know, you're just on Robin Hood yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Are you kidding? Like that's, it's impossible if you're like a young male to step away from the computer. Well, and there's a real sense of back to the idea of alienation. I mean, in some of the threads I've read for GameStop, you know, there's still a, a simmering anger from the housing crisis and the bailouts, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who saw their parents lose everything and never recover. I mean, there's some really, I'll send you guys the some of the links, but like there's some harrowing stories personal stories that people have posted on Reddit and stuff about like why they're all invested in this thing, both literally mm -hmm. and, and emotionally. Yeah, And like the idea for them is like, look, I've been poor my entire life. Uh, I'll invest 300 bucks, even though I only have 600 because like it's all, it doesn't m make a difference to me. Right. It's more important for me to like use what little power I have collectively with my other friends to like, like screw over a bunch of yeah, Hedge who cares? <laughs> it's yeah. not about making money. Right. It's about sticking it to the man, right. and that's why they're able to hold the line even <laughs> when the stock price, you know, is starting to fall and they're refusing to sell. And the power of that is unbelievable. Yeah. And to kind of canvas, you know, the reactions of the institutional investors and the hedge funds. I mean, the Schadenfreude is is delicious, of course, <laughs> because it's the people again. You know, it's like. Let them eat cake. No, you eat cake. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and who's gonna who's gonna? It's a game of chicken, and who's gonna blank first? And Who you have this mob, right? That's really. I think you made a very good point, which is I think we're at a point culturally where the gap between the haves and the haves not, have nots is is reached such a point of division that it's inevitable that mm -hmm. we're seeing these things kind of happen. And if you look back in history, when that gap gets to a certain point, that's when the the government becomes destabilized and you sow the seeds of yeah. this for you know this is just this is a revolution in a in a certain respect using tools that never existed before mm, to yeah. exert power against control. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. going to be the central struggle for the Biden administration is that he has to show the public that government has a purpose. And it has to like, people have to see material improvements in their lives or else mm -hmm. we're all fucked. Yeah. Because of that gap, right? Yeah. Because the accelerationism is happening. It's happening. It's happening. And I think it's also, you know, talking about context, it's, you know, we've experienced the COVID shutdowns and the stock market has in many cases had gains. Yeah. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of CEOs that have made a tremendous amount of money. People are aware of this now. And then we're also dealing with People have a deeper literacy of cryptocurrency and all of this online trading, and people no longer have a sense of reverence for any of this stuff because right. they don't see the way that um, it's affecting them. You know, they're not sort of thinking about their mutual funds <laughs> right. in the basement. <laughs> they're just thinking about sort of causing chaos and then also hoping that this will improve some sort of future that they recognize needs to happen. Right. They well, recognize it, a change needs to happen. It's not just causing chaos though. I mean, they're out to make money. I mean, you know, yes, you have, yeah. they're, they're banding together, right? So the, like, just for your listener, correct me if I'm wrong, I'll try, but just to recap it for listeners that uh -huh. maybe haven't read all the game uh, is, stuff. Is there right? anybody who does <laughs> like, yeah, I'm just assuming but everybody just knows. Just I don't know how you could like not little, know what little, this is. A little but, capsule. Yeah. Um, uh, you have a group of young investors using Reddit forums and TikTok, and they recruit and explain um, these kind of mass uh, mobilized stock purchases. And and GameStop was one, AMC Theaters the other. It, it turns out it's all these analog, analog stocks. It's yeah. like, instead of like, 
you know, the Bushwick hipsters that would use a BlackBerry. <laughs> These people are buying BlackBerry stock and doing it together. <laughs> but first, but obviously it was it was GameStop was the number one. And it's the first guy. It's out like, of nostalgia. Out of nostalgia, mm -hmm. but well, also as a fuck you because right. it's strategic. They see all these hedge funds who are shorting specific stocks, and they know it was the aggressiveness of the short positions that these hedge right. funds were taking. They had commandeered, you know, more shares than were currently available. Like I'm no expert, I don't even right. know how that works, but I think if their short positions hadn't been so aggressive, this might not have ever happened. Yeah. But the Wall Street Bet subreddit, you know, made everybody aware of how egregious this was right. and marshaled yeah. all of these people to take a stand against it. And I think the other important point to make is that the tools to flex your control over this became so fluid that young people who weren't even old enough to get Robinhood accounts could get them, not only get them, but knew intuitively how to use them. They're so easy to use right now. Mm -hmm. And so those things coalesce to create a perfect storm for this event to occur. Yeah, I mean, I think the irony is from what I've read about how the GameStop thing started, it really started like two years ago by one particular yeah, user right. on uh, this particular subreddit, uh, Wall Street Bets, but like it the was- kitty, kind of, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was kind of rooted in, Fundamentals, right? Like he noticed that they actually had a lot of cash on hand. Right, they, they were undervalued. Handle. Yeah. And so it really starts from a, a pretty shrewd position that came from what, you know, this is the lie that that Wall Street tells the public, which is that they know best, right? And here's a perfect example of someone who doesn't have a huge institution behind him, just does a lot of research and sees a hole in the market and an opportunity. And you know, everyone else piles on, but it took right. him like two years. But of Michael posting. Burry piled on too. Yeah. Like yeah. He, yeah. Michael Burry was early on this as yeah. well. Yeah. He was saying the exact same thing. Yeah. He went all in on GameStop. Like, I don't know how long ago, but quite a while ago. But what's funny too, is that this is a return, you know, it's worth pointing out we've because we've kind of trashed 4chan for a while here. This When 4chan really got it in its heyday in its early days, it really came from a more kind of uh, hacktivist, position. It was really during Occupy Wall Street that it started doing its first big raids. And there, you know, some of the first famous ones were against like the Church of Scientology uh, and other sort of financial institution based things. But this is an interesting cultural turn back towards what you might otherwise call like a kind of uh, collectivist pers perspective on like how mm. raids can help benefit well, yeah. and, and the yeah, and the yeah. things that they're trading are, um, you know, GameStop is something that people love. Yeah, like it <laughs> yeah. is nostalgia, yeah. and it's like people have gotten rich off of their passion. Yeah, and therefore there's some just desserts that are happening. Right. Sure. Oh, and your guy that you're talking about, the guy that started it, invested like fifty something thousand dollars and it topped out at over forty million at one point. He yeah. claimed, yeah. Um, and who knows what? The, but like. So that, but it's also a police operation, right? Policing these hedge funds. Now the hedge funds are going to have to watch, right? And, but and now they're hiring their, their own meme department. Uh -huh. So there's a, <laughs> oh so God. there's like no, a countervailing not. war afoot That's amazing. for yeah. in the attention economy, mm -hmm. right? So they're hiring a bunch of young people who are going to create their own memes that are going to contravene the memes that are coming out of Wall Street bets, <laughs> and there's going to be a war of mm -hmm. ideas afoot. But essentially, when you step back from this and look at it, what's to stop? this community of people from every week just deciding, okay, here's what, we're all gonna buy this today. Right. And then millions of people like buy this stuff. Like they, they could just repetitively do this at will and yeah. commandeer the entire market. It's hard though. I mean, like you ask Michael Bloomberg, cause he spent a lot of money creating memes and it got him nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> or ask us, we're trying to sell our film <laughs> to the same community of people <laughs> and as best as we can, it's hard <laughs> to like get a huge movement. Uh -huh. But you know, the truth is- It's so, hard to go viral. It's hard to go viral. Yeah, it is hard <laughs> to go viral. That's, yeah. that's the point. Yeah. yeah. No, but this is a lightning in the bottle kind of moment where I think people are dawning, like people are having a system awareness they weren't aware of before. And they realize how easy it is to game these systems. And there's more people willing to sort of um, be part of that. I think it's also just generational. There's a, there is a younger generation who is really enjoying this that doesn't feel secure in their future. Mm. And how are they going to find meaning in America. Yeah, it's a super um, important point. Yeah, it's the grand narratives of America are going away and we have to figure out new narratives that we can all latch onto to find meaning in our lives. But the problem is you have these two, now there's two dueling stonk projects, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ben Mesrich and uh, the- So this is so, I mean, yeah. on the subject yeah, yeah, of yeah. like the, just the velocity of yeah. the news cycle, yeah. like Ben Mesrich 
hasn't even, like all he has is a book proposal on GameStop. Right. There's no he, book yet. He sells the book and the movie rights get picked up by essentially the same team that made social, um, the, social, social, the social network yeah, with the exception yeah. of Fincher. He's got like the same producing team, the Winklevi are involved. Oh, and then, not involved? Wow. No, the, Winkle, the Winklevi are involved in this project, yeah. Uh, because Mesrick also wrote a book about Bitcoin where right. those two guys are, are like the starring right, right, right. feature in that. At the same time, Netflix just announced another uh, GameStop movie project as well. Right, right. So, but so the, the reason that is important, though, is that like, you know, it's going to be these movies are going to be like, look at the little guy got rich at the expense of the big guy, and we're telling the same story in America. And the story is the answer to your problems is money. Mm, and listen, yes. for someone who's been broke a lot of his adult life and just scraping by, but like, and now has made some money. Money does doesn't buy happiness; <laughs> it buys happier. It's true. <laughs> but like uh, the idea that we need to recalibrate who we are and how we function, um, I think goes that deep. Like we really need to start to ask important questions about <laughs> like meaning of life shit, because otherwise this stuff is going to keep happening. It's the cycles are just kind of keep. But replaying. it's more complicated than the yeah. money. So yeah. much of this is is just the fuck you to the man right. against yeah. a system that has overlooked these people and not given them the opportunities that they feel that they've been promised. And right. so the, the, the American just, dream entitlement. Yeah, it's like right. that, that's, you know, the, the guy who's not worried about losing his 300 bucks, even though he doesn't have any money because the point that's being made is is more important. And that's the sense of emotional connection to a movement and the community aspect of this that's so, it's so powerful. But if yeah. the story is like the answer is we, you know, fuck you, and we made some of your money, um, which yeah. hopefully the movies are more complex than that. But like, because because we don't know how it ends. Right. But some of these people are going to lose all their money, and it won't just go back to the beginning. But like you're saying, you need to see some tangible. Like government has to improve people's lives. There has to be some tangible right. change in the way we relate to each other and in the way government is is viewed, um, because. A lot of what you're saying, like this entitlement, it's like oh, I'm getting screwed. Some of that's just, it's just a story you're telling yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not all true, you know. Like there are opportunities here in this country to do to do better. Um, it's it is hard. It is hard, and the 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 rich are getting richer. It's true, but there is opportunity out there every day you wake up, and we all know that. And so uh, not all of those things are true, but you, that doesn't mean that people aren't embittered. And so there's yeah. this, especially when you look at the rotunda, people who show up like that real estate woman who showed up in a private jet. Mm -hmm. There are people who are, I know people who have done very well and are still embittered, yeah. so embittered that they think the 1619 project is somehow a personal affront to them. Mm -hmm. Like this crazy shit, like that doesn't make any sense. Um, there's a, there's a, a bitterness level to, to this that that is hard to kind of quantif quantify. And then you have people like Holly that you brought up um, who's trying to ride that mm -hmm. basically to yeah. the presidency. Or, or you have these other, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Brobert who are just riding the wave because maybe they're part of the wave, um, you know, calling for the assassination of the Speaker of the House. And that person's now sitting in Congress. Like there's a bitterness level that's just really, we haven't quite figured out yet, right? Like where mm -hmm. it's coming from and how to fix it. But uh, I think there's fundamental questions in this country that need to be answered. Um, and, and, you know, this is a nice story, but like the, to fix it, in order for Wall Street to be safe, in order for all of us to be safe, in order for people to feel good in their own neighborhoods, you gotta fix this stuff. Yeah, yeah the, the, the through line there, the thing that connects QAnon and the Wall Street Bets uh, GameStop thing is that it's two groups of people who um, are experiencing a kind of like um, I don't know rejection of 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 the American dream, but for two completely different reasons. Mm. Like the QAnon people have had to confront a reality that like um, the truth about America, American exceptionalism, has kind of eroded around them. Whether it's like the BLM protest this last summer, or just the fact that the internet exists now, and that the, you were exposed to information that you maybe mm. were hidden from for years before, and now you're having to like confront this reality. And there's a certain level of of uh, what's the term I'm looking for here? I'm not uh, sure. <laughs> uh, like intellectual. What's this? Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. There's, there's, there's a cognitive dissonance <laughs> that's happening, and they want to maintain that 
that that perception of American exceptionalism. And so Q very neatly mm. gives them that, that they're on the side of good and the other people are evil. And then with the GameStop people, it's similarly a, a, a rejection of the American dream or feeling that like it's not there for them. And they're like using their collective energies to like uh, in, impact it in ways that they think will help mm -hmm. ameliorate the problem. So they're both kind of pretty direct. I think it connected. dovetails also with just the the re the religious nature of America. Yeah, we've always been obsessed with apocalypse. Even mm. people who aren't necessarily religious have just th yeah. that's become part of who they are and their thinking. You know, for all these people we've talked about, you know, they believe we're living in the end times. Josh Hawley believes that we are living in Babylon. Hmm. He, it's something where he thinks that, um, you know, the rapture is upon us. There's a lot of people out there who are just hardwired to think that there is no future because they can't conceive of it. And I think that um, sometimes even understanding that is part of the problem. You have like, we were talking about like the GameStop movie. Like I'm sure the end of that movie will be kind of like an anti-corporate idea. Right. at the end of it, but it's being made by a corporation right. who's making money off of that. Right. So this awareness right. Right. of the futility <laughs> right. is only making us more bitter. Right. Yeah. You know, and, it's, and it's ultimately, making us circle the drain it's the more. Story ultimately, that we're this is the way this is gonna shake out is like any casino where the house wins. Yep. Like, okay, Wall Street bets upended these hedge funds, but at some point there's gonna be a recalibration where these hedge funds are gonna come out on top if history tells us anything whether through regulatory measures or what have you, something's gonna occur that is gonna prevent this kind of thing from happening again. But and also, that's only gonna fuel like that level of frustration and discontent. Poor but Elon. In, in terms of the house winning, like Elon. BlackRock owned a significant chunk of GameStop before this and they made something like $3 billion oh, right. out of strike. Right. So like they're and making you, some of them also, We should yeah. point out, you made a good point on Twitter the other day, Giorgio, uh, it would be terrible and disheartening. Like we need to know more about who's invested in these hedge funds that mm. took these short positions because you know, chances are there are pension funds and teachers union funds and things like that. People's retirement is yeah. tied up in these massive hedge yeah. funds. And, yeah. and when those short positions tank and those people lose all their money, those are, those are the very people that are you know the same community. It's like the parents of the Wall Street bets people mm -hmm, right. are losing their retirement yeah. funds yeah. as a result of this. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first time if that ends up happening. It wouldn't be the first time that a four chan raid has gone <laughs> backfired. Yeah. 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 Why? Here's a question for you. We were talking about this, Adam. Yeah. In this conversation around the regulation of these social media platforms or how to you know deal with speech, it seems like. Reddit has gotten somewhat of a pass here. And there's a, there is the conventional wisdom is that Reddit has done a better job than mm -hmm. Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I don't know enough about it to know if that's true or not, but what do you like? Yeah, the, no our one's Donald criticizing existed Reddit for, on, on for, television. Yeah. yeah. They've yeah. had a NAS. I mean, so Ellen, when Ellen Powell was the CEO, I tried to get her to be <laughs> part of the film, but she politely um, declined. But I would have really loved to have talked to her about this. Um, but, you know, she, was removed as CEO during the midst of the Gamergate thing. And I think in hindsight, that was probably a really bad move. And I think they had been like living with, I mean, as the board, I guess, they had been living with the, that guilt of that mistake probably. And I think they've taken pretty proactive mm -hmm. attempts at like, you know, they took down the Donald. Um, moderation just operates a lot differently there. I'm by no means an expert, but for sure, they have definitely skirted a lot of uh, blame. But they also took down the Wall Street bets thing Quite well, they, they did it, they made it private, right? Yeah. And then it went public again, yeah. but I think they pulled yeah. that and now it's Is it up private? the way it was. It was private for a while. Like it, when, the, when the trading volume was insane, they made it private okay. for a minute. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on it either. I think that um, they always try to like, when they pull down like the Donald, they pull down several lefty kind yeah, of like boards at the same time. So they try to give people the illusion of parody, which I think ultimately is probably good. Um, but I don't think radicalization happens on Reddit the same way it happens yeah. in Facebook or in Twitter. Mm. Okay. I think also, I mean, taking Parler down, all these all these sort of things are cursory moves, but you know, everyone uses multiple platforms and the problems still remain on Twitter and Facebook. And those are the places where people I think really lose themselves. Yeah. So it's also like understanding the nature of their mechanics, right? On Reddit, 
things get upvoted and downvoted. So there's kind of a consensus there that's much different than, for example, the way 4chan works, right. which things flow to the top just simply by virtue of the engagement. So in 4chan, if you just post something really incendiary and get a lot of uh, posts, replies to it, it'll it'll move to the top. So those are, it's like kind of nuanced, but it, it, it produces much different yeah. thinking. I think Reddit's more of an entertainment site, whereas these other are more lifestyle sites. Mm. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, so if you're on Facebook, the way that radicalization will often happen on Facebook is you have these sort of extreme ideas coming into places that are not extreme. You have people liking and sharing this stuff and then ultimately normalizing it in the same feed that they're sharing pictures of their grandkids mm -hmm. or you know memes about Bible verses or whatnot. And Reddit, the, the flow of information isn't quite so chaotic. You're going there for specific Specifics, reasons yeah, to, to be part of a specific community. Facebook though, you really kind of end up absorbing these ideas in what seems to be a relatively organic way. They're fed to you. Yes, yeah. they're fed to you. And so, um, yeah, we're just, we have this problem right now where there's just a lot of toxic waste in the system and it's mutating people. And I don't know <laughs> how and you- we do have and I don't know how, zombies out there. Yeah, well, totally. And was precious. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah. it's hard to, it's hard, you know, uh, on 4chan as related to Pepe, like there's the, the big thing people will say when they haven't seen Feels Good Man yet is that like, Pepe isn't a hate symbol. You took the bait, you normie. Right. There was a, there were some YouTube comments on our podcast. Oh, there you go. That. Yeah, like a <laughs> exactly. bunch of those guys. Exactly. And I was like, <laughs> did, you listen, yeah. did you watch the podcast? Like, <laughs> but it's like that Pepe represented a way to like what we call it, Arthur referred to earlier as like being ir irony poisoned. That there's a moment at which you can't tell what is joke and what is real. And for a lot of new users of social media in general, older audiences, it's even harder for them to discern what's newer or what's real or what's a joke. And it just like reminded me, I, I was trying to find the article before we came today, but I remember when the Colbert Report uh, went off the air and there was an article in like The New Yorker or something about it. And they said that something like, some astonishingly high number of regular viewers of the show did not discern that it was satire. Like 20% mm. of the regular audience didn't Get understand out. that Colbert was doing a bit. And so I think about that. And then, wow. <laughs> so, like, we should have all moved to Sydney. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, anyway, I would love uh, to. I'm pretty sure that's, I'm not making that up. One question <laughs> before you, ra Rabbit Rich um, was Pepe in the Rotunda? Yeah. 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 But yeah. not as much as you would have thought, maybe. Well, I mean, there were a handful of people there wearing Pepe masks and then there were some Pepe signs. But I mean, it is interesting to they see- They older the, people. Mm, some of the people masks were younger. Yeah. Though it was interesting to see like at the rally in Georgia before the election uh, there, there was a number of people who were wearing like Pepe stuff. Like there was a guy wearing a Pepe shirt, but he was an older guy. He was like mm. 65 and all the people who were who were commenting on it underneath the posting were all like older women who were like, Pepe, Pepe. <laughs> so the generational shift is oh, apparent God, in, that, in that moment. Um, I mean, obviously memes played a huge part in the Rotunda riot. Um, you saw yeah. the Kekistani flag, you saw all this different stuff. And people were often, you know, a lot of the Proud Boys were wearing anti-Semitic, you know, the Holocaust didn't happen, mm -hmm, you know, right. six million is not enough kind of um, memes. It was a very memed thing in part because I think people really wanted to participate in it through social media and this was a way to do it. And then obviously to find each other in the crowd because it was so chaotic. Mm. Um, yeah. Despite the presence of Pepe though, it, it does feel like culture's kind of moved on. Like it, it, sure. it wasn't yes. omnipresent in that at all. Like yeah. it was kind of there, but it's, the sense that I got was like, okay, we're we're on to other things. Pepe's now. Like played that's, out. Yeah, it's for played sure. out, right? Sure. Pepe is a much yeah. different, there's a much bigger relationship, like positive relationship people have to Pepe. For example, on Twitch, it's like the number one. If you look at a list of the 100 most used emotes on Twitch, Pepe occupies like 50 of the top 100 and they Whoa. all are like back to the original Pepe version of just being a funny reaction hey, image. Yeah. Matt's getting his Wow, wish. Matt, yeah. It, yeah. It's true. I'm it's still true. trying to wrap my head yeah. around wearing a Holocaust denial merch <laughs> to just stand out in a crowd so your buddy can see you. Yeah, I'm over I'm at 4-H. I'm wearing uh, the, totally. you know, six million is not enough t-shirt. I'm the only guy. I'm the, uh, I'm the only guy. Yeah. yeah. I, there's yeah. a big okay. space around me. It's okay, folks. Yeah. I'm Be Jewish. careful can, though, because a, Jewish, a laser might get you from space. <laughs> right. Oh my God. Like, can we talk about, it? is she the 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 uh, dumbest congressperson of our lifetime? 
I will say De- Denver Top five. Denver Riggleman, the uh, former Republican congressman who we we shot a little bit with last last year. Um, he's gotten into it quite a bit with her online, but he made something very a very like simple point to make, which was just that the starting salary for a congressperson or the salary for a congressperson is like one hundred sixty five thousand dollars or something. He's like, yeah. that's more money than most people have ever seen or will ever see, and like. Yeah, we're overpaying for what, that. What you're seeing is the, in the, is the enmeshing basically of like uh, social media personalities and government. And it's like, if you're going to be a grifter, it's never been a better time to be in government as a grifter, basically. Oops. Because you also can can raise money exactly. beyond that. Like, look exactly. at, mm-hmm. didn't, wasn't, didn't, wasn't it disclosed that Trump made, like raised how many million dollars? Or was it 31. Oh, well, in the two weeks after the election, yeah. yeah. 200 something million dollars. Right. Yes. Something. And he spent zero on the, it was all under the, well, the one I read was like 31 or $32 million specifically on emails that were about Senate in Georgia. And he spends literally zero dollars. Yeah, because there was like a, a <laughs> I can't right. wait for the there was an asterisk, counting to come By the way, we don't have to spend this yeah, on this. Exactly. We can keep it. <laughs> Boy, off it. Yeah, I don't know if she's the dumbest or not, but she might be. I mean, it's pretty astounding. It's pretty bad. It's, like, Bobert and her are wild. Yeah, they're, they're, they're basically just that. assemblages of memes. I mean, even when you hear them talk. They can't speak. Yeah, it's yeah. just like a regurgitation of internet gab. Yeah, gab. I mean, they're- Which is they're why Trump I think Holly is worse because I didn't know about, that about, about Holly's um, feeling about living in Babylon. Like I think I was reading, you know, the reporting on Holly is that he was thought of as this star and really mm-hmm. an intellectual mm-hmm. giant. And, yeah. and, um, and the fact that he is like, uh, you know, it's great to see his him disavowed by his mentor, but who doesn't have to run for Dan Forth, anymore. Right. Yeah, but Dan like Forth. the way he's saying it's the biggest mistake of his entire life, and that carries and, water. Like yeah. I'm from I'm from Missouri, yeah, and um, so Danforth is definitely um, a very powerful and well loved politician in Missouri. I'm curious to see what Holly's future is in the state, um, in part because Missouri's often been a bellwether. Um, you know, people like you know Roy Blunt and uh, John Ashcroft and these sort of people have come out of Missouri and then come into the international stage and had a lot of power. Um, yeah, Holly is an ideologue. He, he's unlike Bobert and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, he has like a very specific ideological framework that he talks about, you know? He talks about it in Christian media more so than in national media. But yeah, he's someone who like a lot of, I, a lot of the insurrectionists have given up on democracy. Mm-hmm. It was a coalition of people who have given up on democracy and he's one of them. He doesn't believe that freedom can exist in a civil society because we're not all Christian he evangelicals. Just wants, he just wants power. Yeah, yeah. completely. And it's frightening and, because- And he because thinks he, it's divinely, yeah, uh, it, yeah he thinks it's, it, it comes from Jesus Christ. So. And he's not a dummy. You know, that, no. Politico, that Politico article yeah. was very revealing. It, it, was, it, it, it interviewed a bunch of his professors at Stanford. And David Kennedy, who's a professor that I had at Stanford, like I know David Kennedy, said that Josh was the most talented student that he ever had. You know, and like, mm. this is a guy who's bright. Yeah, His ideas might not align with yours, but he should not be underestimated. And he cannot be lumped in with the Boberts and the Taylor Greens. He's a yeah, different yeah. animal. And when, when, when he was 15, he wrote uh, in the, his Lexington, newspaper, Lexington, Missouri newspaper in defense of the militia after the Oklahoma City bombing and just saying that militia, people who are in militia shouldn't be maligned as racist. They shouldn't be called terrorists as a 15 year old. So, you know, so even though- He's this, not opportunist he, he's been, in his ideology. I think he is an opportunist like to, to your Well, but your it's, it's inbred in, it's not, it's not, he's not a Johnny come lately to these ideas no. because it's opportunistic to right. be that way. This right. is the person that he's been. Mm. I'm curious and he's though just because been masking it in because different company. He yep. comes across as such an egghead. I think there's a part of Republican politics that doesn't necessarily like the Ivy League education. Right. You know, I, I'm curious to see. I think him, you know, sort of coming out in basically in support of the insurrection um, was him trying to seem alpha. Was him trying to sort of play Trump's game to Trump's audience. Right. And I think they're going to see through it. I think they're going to realize the way they that see through is, Ted Cruz. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe, yeah. but you know, here's the thing: is that like, so I, I was, I gave you my optimistic view on how this is going to work out well. <laughs> Come for on, us. man, we gotta, here's we gotta land doomsday. this. Yeah, in, in land the, uh, gonna we gotta it. go hardcore. No, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. Hardcore, happy. happy. It's gonna, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna segue <laughs> with Babylon <laughs> right. Berlin, uh-huh. and that is like people were talking about Kristallnacht as the, as like the Nazi equivalent of what happened at the 
rotunda, but that's not what it was. It mm. was the push. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it right, but in 1929 or 30, I forget when it was, when Hitler's first attempt to take over government, um, he had a mob like this and he was arrested and he was put in jail and he was eventually pardoned and came out of it and ended up, you know. We all know where that went. We, we all know where that <laughs> went. So the question really is, you know, it's easy. I, I, I also, my instinct is that anyone who tries to play Trump's game is going to lose because only Trump can play it. Yeah. And I think Holly will lose. But there is, a, like, if there's any one of those people that scares me, it's him. And 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 uh, and we won't know what happens. Like you said, like this is, there's a 10-year timeline to where this is going. And hopefully we'll come out of it. I think we can come out of it. I think we mapped out how we'll come out of it. But there is a, there are multiple realities. So we'll, we'll see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if we know Godspeed. anything, we know by next week, everything <laughs> will be, yeah. some, something else crazy will happen and we'll be having a different conversation. In the meantime, watch yeah. this movie. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks um, for having this yeah, on. Yeah, I love yeah. that you were in the shirt. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. I love having you guys here. That was super fun. Uh, please, everybody who's listening or watching, go out, check out Feels Good Man on Apple Plus, preferably. Uh, it's a fantastic documentary. If you have not listened to the podcast that I did with these gentlemen a couple of weeks ago, check that out. I'll link that up in the show notes and in the description below. Uh, how's it going with the movie before we end it here? It's it's Oscar week. It's Oscar People week. are voting. People are voting. If you're we got to get attention on film. this movie. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're a dark horse. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely a dark horse. <laughs> I was going to say, but but it's it's gone great. We did a big we did a big Twitch live stream actually with. Um, a number of gamers. Lots, lots of uh, Academy voters on Twitch, exactly. right? <laughs> you know, no, no Academy voters, but Fury was on Fury was on the line with us. And oh, it was cool. like, great. It was a very like positive, interesting, engaged conversation. Um, we continue to meet people who the, the film means something to them. Um, yeah. It, it's a long tail film. It's a long tail film yeah. that, and yeah, it's something we've been so passionate about. It's great to see it out in the world and people responding to it. Yeah, I mean, the best documentary of the year is definitely Time on Amazon, which you should definitely watch. So by no means do we think we have a chance in hell of uh, winning anything, but it would be nice to just get shortlisted. <laughs> time get, is a really good movie. Short let's get you shortlisted. Let's get you I like your movie better. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like Time. Yeah. I like Time. It's, yeah. it's really yeah. fascinating that, that, that was movie. one, if there was a movie yeah. theater, that's that's one I really breaks yeah. my heart. There was a, yeah. that I and agree. I, that was the last film we saw at Sundance last year and it's like, it's a beautiful movie. And yeah. Sundance is going on right now. Are you guys doing any panels or you have any involvement no, with no, that? No, no. but our, our our producers who worked on Feels Good Man with us have a couple films there. They have a film named Cusp, Cusp. that yeah. um, mm -hmm. I haven't seen, but I'm excited to see it. And um, yeah, it is too bad it's all online. Yeah, I mean, it's such yeah, a I fun know. experience to I go know. there and just- Have you seen their virtual wrestling? waiting room no. thing? No. Yeah. Oh, it's really dystopic. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. Man, I mean, it's such just, a fun in-person event. Yeah, like I just can't exactly. imagine the virtual version of it. Well, yeah. hopefully that's I mean, how the world will change between this podcast being recorded and put out in the world. The yeah. pandemic will it will help. Yeah. It will help yeah. if people can hang out. 100%. <laughs> that's true. It will 100%. Help. Yeah, it will absolutely. Help. Absolutely. Right. If the kids can go back to school. <laughs> that's the title of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. I just have the title of the episode. Yes. Now. We we don't do well on our own <laughs> at loose ends. Yeah, I mean, in a weird way, the, the anti-maskers are really just people that are just dying for a hug. That's really all they want at the end right, of the day. They right. just can't deal with. That's right. That's right. right. There was a, uh, I think it was an, it was either an Onion article or some other kind of uh, um, satire uh, piece on the internet that said proud boy gets turned with one hug from dad or something. <laughs> That's hard times, yeah, hardtimes.com. Yeah. <laughs> it's anyway. true. Um, C feels good, man. Thanks yes. for coming on, you Thank guys. You so much. Come back anytime. Let's let's continue this conversation. Thank Thanks you both. for having us. All right, yeah. Yeah. and let's great. all go hardcore happy. Hardcore Absolutely. happy. Hardcore happy. Well, that that you brought your you have a guest coming up that can teach us how to be how to connect with each other, right? We do, yeah. yeah we'll Adam talk about Grant. that after the break. All right, cool. cool. So we'll take a break. We'll be back with more. All right, and we're back. I love those guys. That was oh, great. Man. Hot. I thought it might be like 30 to 40 minutes. How long did we go? Like an hour, right? There's you no know, way I was gonna interrupt Time that. stops when good. I'm with you, Rich, especially when I'm talking. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So this is going to be yet another marathon uh, <laughs> yes, roll on, right? Yes, yes. But I think we, during the break, we decided to eviscerate the outline a little bit to not make it too long. But I do want to no. do a little bit of 
show and tell, a couple wins of the week, and we'll get to three listener questions. And at the top of my list of show and tells, I've got two things. The first thing is, and this is nothing new, but I just felt like amidst all the darkness, we could all use a little bit of innocent happiness. Yes. And I wanted to draw a little bit of attention to David Lynch's wonderful weather reports. <laughs> Are you familiar with this? I am. I am. I Because I, I, I listen to KCRW. And so he pops up on Morning Becomes Eclectic. Does he do the weather report yeah, on, he's on their the weather radio? Guy. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know when he started doing this, but on YouTube, every single day, he just looks to camera and he yeah. says, good morning, today is whatever it is. And then he looks out the window and he tells you what the weather is gonna be. And it's just the best. He looks great. I love it. You know, it, it, there's a short list of people that can stay cool for like four decades. He's the coolest. Um, Bowie and David Lynch. Mm -hmm. There's only a few people, right. Prince. There's and only my, a few. My son, Tyler yeah. and Trapper just love David Lynch. Like, yeah. They just can't get enough of him. And how old is he now? He's in his seventies, yeah, right? That's what I mean. And he's it's still like, the coolest guy in the room. Right. No matter what. He is. And all he does is say, this is what the weather's gonna be like today. And I don't know what it is about his energy, but I'm always glad that I watch it. Yeah, he's happy. He's a happy, it's like happy. he makes you feel <laughs> happier. I know. Yeah. It's great. We all need more of that. It was trending on Twitter, I think today, because he announced that he was thinking about not doing it anymore yeah. and all the fans revolted. And so his big announcement was that he would continue with his weather report. He's going to keep doing it. Supplemented with also, I don't know if you know this, he also does the number of the day. Yes, <laughs> but not everyone has a number of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, is, that, is that like a lot? Does he play the numbers? No, he just basically says the number of the day is, and he just says a number. Okay. And that's the number of the day, according to David Lynch. I wonder if it, like his, his parents played the numbers back I in New York or I, something. I, I think you're attributing too much I'm of reading, forethought to I'm all reading of this. too deep yeah, into it. Yeah, just take it for what it is. <laughs> um, I would say a second cousin to this is uh, Anthony Hopkins' little videos that he posts on oh, Twitter and see Instagram. Those. They're always full of love and happiness. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Check you mean Hannibal Lecter? Yeah, he's great. Full of love and happiness? Anthony Hopkins, not to be confused with <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. All right, let's keep it moving. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, Babylon Berlin, yes. which is a TV show that I wanted to share with all of you guys that I've been enjoying. It's a German series that's airing on Netflix. It was created by writer-director Tom Teichwer, uh, who is the guy behind Run Lola Run and also Cloud Atlas. And I find this show, I'm in, I'm like near the end of season two. There's three seasons currently available that are streaming right now. And I find this show to be really fascinating for a number of reasons. First of all, it's, it's exceptionally photographed. Like mm. It's visually arresting and stunning. And essentially it's a story, it's multiple stories that take place in Berlin, post-World War I, in the midst of this newly emerged Weimar Republic where it's a new democracy, but it's a fragile democracy. And we see this extraordinary wealth disparity. On the one hand, you have this roaring 20s uh, culture of nightclubs and fabulous music and dancing and drinking and revelry uh, juxtaposed against extreme poverty. And the storylines elucidate the fragility of democratic institutions, it's about corruption, and it's about the nationalistic creep that ultimately later leads to Nazism mm -hmm. through the lens of the protagonist who is this um, police investigator and all the kind of people that he encounters. And a war, and, World War I veteran. Yeah, that's World like War I veteran. And so there's a lot effective. of there's a lot of, you know, guys with disfigured faces and and maimed and and he, this protagonist, you know, also has these essentially PTSD panic attacks mm -hmm. where he has to down some unknown pharmaceutical like that I assume is like morphine or something, yeah, or something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, he just goes Lodlum. into these these shaking fits and and I, I don't know. I I just think it's standing in and of itself. It's a fascinating look into a particular culture, but I think it also. Um, is prescient and relevant to some of the things that our culture is grappling with right now, the fragility of our own democratic institutions and the nationalistic creep that you see when that wealth gap becomes as extreme as it did in Germany at that time and as it's uh, quickly becoming in our country. 
Great movie. Uh, I mean, a great show. Thank you for recommending. I just saw the pilot last night. And Run, Lola, Run was one of my favorites when it came out. That's great. Um, and so I was really excited about it. It's it's really good. I, I'm into it. And the best part is that through that show, I finally figured out how to get to subtitles in prestige foreign television on Netflix. Because before, it was always these horrible dub things, and I couldn't get through one of them. One but you could just select audio <laughs> and then it gives you all these options hey, now. Hey, I, I did it. It's interesting I did that it. You, you opt for subtitles. I do. And I opted for the dubbing. You like the dubbing. I don't want to read when I'm watching. Yeah. But here's the thing. You get the dubbing, of course, it's it's jarring. I can't watch a mixed match. <laughs> you know, I can't like, do that. I can't. It doesn't <laughs> quite work, but <laughs> no, at some point you synced. just get over it and you just go with it. And the acting's not as good. It's not. It's not as good a voice. Yeah. 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 And then and then if you go back to um, just the subtitles, the, the when you've gotten used to the dub voice, yeah. and then you hear what their voice actually sounds like, that's also very jarring. Yes. But anyway. But anyway, I think that the reason it's please. important what you're saying is that even today, there's no country that really mirrors what we're going through better than Germany, not because it's as diverse as we are or um, has exactly the same problems, but there is this far right QAnon worshiping kind of militia, like white supremacist element that has infiltrated uh, into politics and into even um, police departments and 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 the military itself shut down an entire special forces unit. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff's all been really well reported by the New York Times. I think we've even maybe touched on it once. And, uh, and so they're going through the same thing we are. So it's interesting that he's using the 1920s because when it really first started, you know, the cycle, right. that same stuff was happening. We're familiar, it's, it's a period of time in Germany that I'm just not that familiar with. Right. Like we but, know about World War I and we know about World War II, but what happened in between those that led to the rise of Hitler? Right, but that, that same kind of proto-fascist, like begin, like leading towards fascism, that lean, to the, the tear between, socialism and and what was going to become fascism those same threads were ha that same those same currents are running through america at the same time right when you had the Lindbergh mm -hmm. candidacy and all mm -hmm. the would be Lind so all of that stuff was happening we've been mirrors of each other for a long long time so it's really interesting to watch it now because yeah. uh it's still entertaining because it, it does transport you you're not thinking about our problems when you're watching it but it is it does give it like that that relevance yeah and yeah. what's great is there's three seasons of it so I yeah. can be enjoying this for quite a while. Exactly. Cool. Um, why don't you hit me with your win of the week? My win of the week uh, was the K2 climbers, the the Nepalese team of nine climbers that uh, got up to the top of K2 in winter for the very first time. It was the last of the 8,000 meter peaks to be climbed in winter. They've all now been conquered in, in spring, summer or winter. Um, K2 has uh, by far the highest uh, mortality rate on its slopes mm -hmm. um, compared to any of the others. It's, it's, it's night and days uh, more dangerous than even Everest. Um, and uh, so it was just, I did that story for the New York Times when it happened. I, I was turned on to the story because I knew Colin O'Brady was among the many climbers that went out. Right, to, he's still like at base camp, he's still right? At base he's been camp. at base camp for months. Yeah. And so he was, uh, he was one of that part of that group. That's how I first got turned on to the fact that, that people were trying for this. And then um, one of the people who I knew about, uh, that he told me about was Nims Dai uh, or Nims Perja, who is the, the guy that set the record, world record for climbing all the 8,000 meter peaks in, uh, in, within a certain amount of time. And he saved, he shaved over seven years mm. off the record. Wow. And, uh, and so Nims Perja, is this great Nepalese climber, former British special forces and all these other, and he's not Sherpa, he's not from the Sherpa culture, but everybody else was that was in that group. And so this story is about how they got up to the top and how that all happened. And, um, and what's cool, they've been, they, they were greeted back in Kathmandu recently with a hero's welcome, like a, a, big, a big motorcade. They've been treated like celebrities or the toast of the town. Right. They, were, they were flown out. Uh, from base camp by the Pakistani military and, and got an audience with the prime minister or the president of Pakistan like right away. It did become a big story. It's a, it's it's a big cool. deal. It's a big deal because what's cool is all of the 8,000 meter peaks in Nepal were all credit, even though there, were, there was always an Nepalese climber right behind whoever got the credit. It was always the European or, or Western climber that got the first right. ascent. That's who got credited. Um, so, uh, so, 
this is this is basically a correction. Yeah, for it's that. very cool. Yeah. So everybody, check out Adam's article in the New York Times. It's called "How Climbers Reach the Summit of K2 in Winter for the First Time." You've got uh, comments from Renan, Jimmy Chin, Adrian yep. Ballinger, all kinds of cool people. Yeah, hat tip to Rich Roll to get Jimmy Chin to to uh, I, connect. Yeah, yeah you, you did. did. You're you the did. journalist yeah, here, man. Um, good stuff, dude. Well, Thank my you. my win of the week. Uh, hands down goes to Jim Walmsley, who is an ultra runner, extraordinaire, uh, guy lives in Arizona, for those who, don't, who aren't familiar, who just the other week uh, attempted to break the world record in the 100K at this event called the Hoka One Project Carbon X event that was in Chandler, Arizona. Uh, he ran 100 kilometers in six hours, nine minutes, <laughs> and 26 seconds <laughs> and ultimately came up just 12 seconds shy of the world record, which was set in 2018 uh, by Japan's Nao Kazami. That's I'm crazy. pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. But he did set an American record by 18 minutes and a PR of 45 minutes. So mm. this is insane. Just so people can grok exactly how extraordinary this is, he ran 556 pace mm. for over six hours straight and he clipped a fence at about three and a half hours into this thing and his shoulder was bleeding like it's just it's bananas and in and of itself this is an unbelievable accomplishment but when you set it in the context of this guy's career um, it's really noteworthy because what's unique about Jim is that he excels not just in ultra running but in many distances across many terrains he's won a ton of ultras of course uh, he was the uh, victor in the 2018 and the 2019 Western States 100, which is kind of widely considered one of, the, one of if not the most prestigious uh, ultra running race in the world. He set the course record in 2018, and then he broke it again in 2019 by 21 minutes. Crazy. But he also uh, qualified for the Olympic trials in the marathon by running a 64 minute half marathon and then running a 215 uh, marathon at the Olympic trials. So this is a guy who can kill it on the road. He can kill it at the half marathon. He can go a hundred miles and then some. So, so was he incredibly was he set versatile to compete for, in the Olympics? No, I mean, he he ran the Olympic trial. He did, he ran 215. So he wasn't oh, going to make the Olympic okay. team with that. But for a guy who, it's unusual for somebody who, who um, specializes in ultras or hundred mile races to be a decent marathon. Right. Because- Usually go by comparison, slower, right? yeah. the, the marathon is like the, the the level of speed that you have to run the marathon in to be at the elite level yeah. is a completely different pursuit than running right. a hundred mile trail race at altitude. Like have you ever run just a marathon? Like not not the, the tacked on I the have, end of, yeah, the, of the Iron Man. No, I have. I, I ran the Long Beach Marathon before I did any of the Ultramans, and it was not a good experience. <laughs> but it was before I knew what I was doing. But I'm not. But I would never be good time. at that. I'm not. Fa yeah. I'm not a fast runner. You know, I'm a. I'm a tortoise. I was just curious if so, you've ever done it. Like done the New York. I could see you wanting to do the New York Marathon. Maybe at some point. Yeah. We'll see. Um, here's an interesting fact about Jim. Before we move on, he went to the Air Force Academy and worked as a missileer in oh. Montana, working underground on nuclear weapons at 24-hour shifts. So he's also. You got to. I would suspect you got to be a pretty smart dude. You do, but to see, do this that. is always curious to me about people who have dangerous jobs. They shouldn't have 24 hour shifts. I agree like, with like, that, like, I agree like, with. Like why, why are surgeons having- Well, the like, article <laughs> that I read this in, it just kind of put the 24 hour thing at the end of the sentence, yeah. but it doesn't make sense. Doctors, no, like right. why? I don't want my nuclear weapons guy <laughs> to not get eight hours of sleep. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. <laughs> I'd agree with that. All yeah. right, um, let's do some listener questions. Okay. Um, we didn't get to the Adam Grant book, by the way. Um, do you want to get to oh, that? Oh, yeah. Show so, and tell? so today's Monday. On Wednesday, I'm interviewing Adam Grant for the podcast. Uh, for those that don't know, he is an organizational psychologist, multiple New York Times bestselling author, Wharton's most popular professor really? of all time, like named the most. But you know, he's got millions of views on his TED talks. He's just an incredible person, and his focus is really on trying to help people figure out how to live and pursue meaningful professional lives. Like it's all about like work life. He's got a podcast called Work Life. Anyway, he's got a new book out called 
think again. And so he's very much in the press at the moment. And he wrote a New York Times um, op-ed the other day that was kind of relevant to what we were talking about with Giorgio and Arthur in that it was about how you interface with and communicate with people who have a very different perspective on either an issue or a worldview. And our inclination is to kind of come at them with facts about why they're wrong and why you're right, uh, but that never seems to work. And his ultimate conclusion is really, we need to enter into these kinds of exchanges from a perspective of, of empathy and curiosity and a true desire to try to understand, like from a question asking perspective mm -hmm. as opposed to an indicting kind of, you know, telling point of view. Yeah. And that's relevant, I think, when, you know, we're in a divided state at the moment and whether, you know, it's politics or some other, you know, choose your issue, everybody's in their information silo and yeah. being, you know, uh, you know, fed a certain type of news that that that, you know, satisfies their respective cognitive bias. And it's important for us to understand that just because we see other people with their cognitive biases doesn't mean that we don't have our own. We all have our right. own. And and in order to kind of create that ability to communicate healthily, we need to be objective about our own biases. And I think when you when you endeavor to communicate with another person from that perspective of curiosity, you're in a position to perhaps learn something that you wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. And I liked it because, you know, I I definitely fall prey to like my emotions when I get like locking horns on like these issues that are I that I find so important because they are so relevant to like people's lives, right? So mm -hmm. you want to you you want to I kind of try to tilt towards justice and in that realm and you know everyone getting oppor equal opportunity and feeling good in life or having opportunities. So um when I end up locking horns, I, I typically do get uh, a little too emotional. So it was really helpful to see it laid out because the times I've been effective at communication has always been when I've been more, you know, taking mm -hmm. a step back and just ask simple questions. Right. Um, it's, it's a really great article. I can't wait to read the book because one point he makes is process matters in these conversations and how you approach these things matters in who you are and how you feel about yourself ultimately. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there's, there's that take home, take home as right. well. Yeah. So more on that in my conversation. Looking forward to that account. one. All right, listener questions. All right, let's cue it up. Hey, Richard Adam. Uh, my name is Kevin from the St. Louis area, and I have a question about productivity of sorts. So I'm sitting here today watching the events unfold at the Capitol building, trying to comprehend what's going on and how we've gotten to this point. I'm also using this time, amongst other times in 2020, to reflect on my privileges, actions, and my role for a better tomorrow. I also have full-time studies as a medical student that today in particular I find very difficult to focus on. In the midst of a global pandemic as well, I'm finding it difficult to be productive. I feel the expectations of my position as a student and during normal times, school, school is hard enough as it is. My mind tells me that what I'm doing has less importance when our country is hurting so much. My question for you, and Rich, is your advice on how to focus on school and maybe for others their job and to maintain some semblance of what you're supposed to be doing amidst all that's going on. I'm finding it hard at times to get in the groove with all of this. Thanks for all your insights and discussion to both of you. They mean a lot to me. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thanks, Kevin, for that question. Obviously, this question was lodged some weeks ago yeah. in the midst of the insurrection. And I think you know, the sentiment that he's conveying is pretty human and pretty normal. I, I suspect, you know, a lot of people will will relate to that. And it's indicative of, you know, a very strange and extraordinary time that we're all living through where we're all trying to do our best. <laughs> I was glued but to we're that holding a, We're holding ourselves to a standard of behavior of how we would operate in a normal, normal time. situation. Yeah. And these are not normal situations. So the first thing I would say is like, give yourself a break a little bit right now, be a little gracious with yourself. And that's not to say let yourself off the hook, but um, I think it's okay to take a breather and not beat yourself up for feeling unproductive in in this moment. Um, in terms of, of how to move forward, I mean, my, my advice is pretty straightforward and, and, and simple and basic. I mean, the first thing is, Try to control the controllables. There's so much about this that we have no control over. We have no agency over it. 
the only things we do have control over is our behaviors and our thoughts and our interactions. You're in medical school. So what's, you know, the thing in front of you that you need to get done and break those tasks down into bite-sized chunks and try to execute on them, you know, in, in the best way possible. Just do the least amount that you need to do to engender a little bit of, of momentum and, um, and, and just look for the next right thing. You know, I think it's incumbent upon you as a medical student and somebody who's clearly very busy, it's okay to take a break from the news. Like yeah. the news will be the news and you don't have to be, you know, hamstrung in your life because of the news cycle. Like you can take that in chunks as well at certain points of the day if you feel you need to, but the news will continue and exist whether you're consuming it or not. Um, I also sense a little bit of of guilt or maybe even shame. Like I feel th this person feels like they want to contribute and be of service uh, in a way that they're not feeling connected to in the moment. Mm. And I think it's important to just figure out how to be a giver in your own way. That doesn't mean that you have to raise your hand and be some kind of prominent voice in a political movement, but in your own universe, you you know, can be of service to, I don't know if you're dealing with patients yet, but your fellow students and your professors, like how can you uh, exercise small gestures in a giving type of way that make you feel more connected to the people around you and engender, uh, you know, a tighter, a tighter community. Mm -hmm. On the privilege piece, look, you know, it's fine to acknowledge your privilege, but I don't think that you should feel guilty about the position that you're in. I'm sure you worked very hard to be where you're at. Mm -hmm. and you know, if there's anything, you, you don't have to atone for it, but like, I think it's, you should make the most of it uh, and and just to be the best doctor that you can be in service to other people. So to the extent that you may not be able to make a difference, you know, geopolitically, you can find meaning and fulfillment in your work. And that is your unique lever for making a difference. And I think as a doctor, you can make a tremendous amount of difference in so many people's lives. So give yourself a break. It's a pandemic. Things are weird. They're hard. It's all okay. Just do what's in front of you. Beautiful. I agree. I think sometimes like these bigger storylines that are floating over us, they take on this incredible importance because they they call into question kind of these stories that we've been telling ourselves about who we are and where we live and what the people around us are up to. And they're paralyzing and, also. And they're paralyzing, but in reality, real life happens super local. It's on the ground right mm -hmm. around you. And right. all of that, unless we lived in DC, it didn't affect us really. Like, so um, it affected us emotionally, but it wasn't like, it didn't change our abilities to move around in our in our localities. Right, And so, um, I think you're right. Like finding, keeping it super local, keeping it simple sometimes is the answer. But you know, that's coming from a guy who literally couldn't do anything for like five days. So <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you, St. Louis. All right. Let's go to John. All right. John from Sierra Nevada. Hi, guys. My name's John. Uh, I live in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And my question for you guys is uh, more so directed at Rich, but, uh, you know, how do you, how do you address failure and like, like the colossal type of failure, the type of failure that makes you feel like your, your life's falling apart or, you know, the wheels are falling off and you can't grab onto the reins and get control of things again. You know what the higher version of yourself needs to do, but you can't do it because all you can feel is the, the lower version of yourself, you know? And, uh, how do you tackle things like guilt and shame and how do you, uh, address and like adjust your lifestyle to set yourself up for success anyway thank you guys i love the show i love you guys you uh done a lot for me and i appreciate it thanks again bye that's heavy mm. um i can feel the pain in this one yeah um it's tough you know it sounds like john's going through something extremely difficult we don't know the details of what that is uh but I intuit a sense of, of, of powerlessness in, in what he's relating, right? It's the idea of the, the two wolves, like which wolf do you feed? And the dark wolf is the one who's getting the best of him at mm. the moment. And there's a sense of 
an inability to kind of arrest that negative impulse. Mm -hmm. And I know what that feels like, it's really hard. And you know, for me, that was in the form of alcoholism. And the solution that I had to come to was breaking the chains of denial and throwing my hands up in the air and, and literally surrendering rather than trying to control it, letting go. And letting go for me meant letting other people in. So I think the first thing I would say to John is, you know, I'm, I'm empathetic and I, and I feel you. Uh, and I think the first thing that you can do to um, try to get on top of this is to confront those feelings rather than repress them or com compartmentalize them to find a way to bring voice to them uh, because things like shame can't survive the light. You've got to shine the light on them. And that's scary. It takes courage to uh, communicate with another person about what you're really going through. It requires a certain vulnerability and it's very frightening, but I can't encourage you enough how important it is to find somebody that that you feel comfortable talking to, that you can be really honest with, that you can convey whatever it is specifically, particularly specifically, I think it's important to be really specific, to let somebody in on this. Um, and the relief that you'll experience just in that alone uh, I think is tremendous. You have to find the right person, somebody you can trust, somebody that you respect, somebody that um, you know can provide you with solid counsel. Um, but I think the process of of that communication isn't of itself a little bit of a letting go, and it will allow you to get a little more objectivity on what's happening with you to help you find the cause, the triggers of those behaviors that are sending you sideways, and ultimately help you um, analyze this story that you're telling yourself that you're a failure and you can't, you can't help yourself and everything's out of control to really deconstruct that and perhaps construct a better, healthier, neg uh, less negative story for yourself. You know, along the way, can you find a way to listen to that you know, positive wolf at all? Can you make any kind of lifestyle adjustments um, that would move you in a positive direction. In recovery, they call it taking contrary action. So mm. when your instinct is, you know, whether it's like, oh, I, I know I shouldn't drink, but I'm gonna take that drink, whatever it is, like what is the contrary action? Like, oh, I don't wanna pick up the phone and tell that guy what I just did. The contrary action is to pick up the phone and tell the guy what you did, right? right? What is the smallest contrary action that you can take that will break the seal on that and, you know, initiate a different, direction for yourself. That's a great little uh, super doable action mm -hmm. step to do. Yeah. Like if your mind's telling you one thing and you know that's the negative thing, just do the smallest do, version of that. Yeah, what would the good version of myself do? And yeah. as heavy as that just phone is there. or whatever it, you know, how difficult it is, if you can just do that one thing and you're like, wow, I did that and I didn't die. Yeah. Right? Um, I think the other thing is to reframe this word failure and recast it as learning. Like, I don't know what this failure, colossal type of failure is specifically again that, that you're experiencing, but can we look at it instead as a learning experience? Like what can you, what can be gleaned from whatever it is that you're going through that you can then leverage to be better and grow? And I think in truth, uh, success is about failure. There isn't success that exists outside of failure. Mm. Success is about trying. It's about not being afraid to fail and not taking failures personally. And the thing that you're attempting to do may have failed, but it's important to depersonalize yourself from that. You didn't fail, this thing failed. You had the courage to try. So can you disassociate your identity, your sense of self, from the thing itself so that your identity isn't tied up in how the thing does, if that makes sense, right? That way you create a little bit of distance between yourself, your identity and your actions. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, keep showing up at the plate and you know, swing the bat because if there's one trait that successful people share, it's that they fail way more than they succeed. They just, try so often and so regularly and we forget about the failures, we only see the successes. And this is another message or theme of Adam Grant's work. Like yeah. his, 
his book Originals was all about this, like what makes people originals. And he looks at all these successful people and realizes like these people failed all the time, whether it's Picasso or, or uh, um, Edison, like they have tons of failures in their wakes and we don't look at those or think about those. We just focus on the few successes they had, but they took more bats at plate than anybody else. So if you can kind of reframe this whole thing from that perspective, uh, that might make it easier to get you know, back up to the plate and, and swing again and really try to objectively deconstruct what you're going through and find the lessons in there. And if you can do that and start figuring out how to implement those lessons to craft a better version of yourself, five years from now, you could look back on whatever it is you're going through right now and say, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And that sounds glib and I don't mean to be insensitive to what you're going through, but I've heard this, I've experienced this myself and I know so many other people that have, and maybe that'll provide you with a little sliver of hope to dig a little bit deeper to get yourself out of this hole. Yeah. When I hear his message, I think of myself, 40 years old, marriage fell apart, Lonely Planet jobs like going away because maybe Lonely Planet is failing. That was what was happening then. And um, that was the worry then, didn't fail. Mm -hmm. But I, I saw all my income going away, which wasn't that huge of an income anyway. I saw my identity as a travel writer or adventure going away. I didn't have the life I thought I'd had. Um, and then that was just the beginning of like, it seemed like everything was working against me, just like one thing after another. And it's hard not to take things personally when it just keeps, it just, you just feel like you're in a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I totally feel that. Uh, and I know how that can, I know how that is. So, um, you know, the only thing is it's like weather. Eventually that luck turns, especially if you take these small steps like Rich laid out. I would add just like, sometimes it helps if in the morning you could do one thing physically that is not, uh, like whether it's do 10 sun salutations or sit down and try to do, meditate for five or 10 minutes um, and turn your brain off if you can. I mean, it's hard to at first, but like one physical thing you can do first thing in the morning, right when you get up. So at least that time, right after that, you kind of feel good. Yeah, a and little self-care. Just a little bit. Uh, and, and to quote Karamo, yeah. uh, can you look at this as something that is happening not to you, but for you. Oh, that's beautiful. I love right? that. Yeah. I and I that. say that you have your version of this story. Look, you know, I've hit bottom as an alcoholic. I've been unemployable. I've been in a situation where my family didn't want anything to do with me. I've had cars repossessed. I almost lost my house. I've been unable to pay my bill. I've had so many, you know, versions of, of feeling like a failure um, and have been able to claw out of it. So I don't know what John's circumstances are, but I do believe and trust that no matter where he is, there is a better place for him and there's always light at the end of the tunnel. There you go. All right, one last one from Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, my name is Sarah and I live in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm wondering if you're willing to discuss just something interesting that I've noticed. So I'm in my first year of sobriety after a long struggle with drugs and alcohol. I am a longtime athlete playing lots of sports and loving running. And I was wondering if you were willing to discuss how overcoming substance abuse has changed your mindset on fitness, your life, your goals, your athleticism, just things like that. I'm a huge fan of the show and I'm super happy to even reach out, but hopefully you'll, um, address these kinds of things in the talk because your story is really powerful and I think it would empower a lot of other people um, to take hold of their life, their bodies, their fitness. Uh, thanks again and I hope that y'all are having a wonderful day. Cool. Thanks for the question, Sarah. Um, congrats on a year of sobriety. That's a huge deal. Mm. Amazing. Um, and it's a great question. It's an interesting question. I mean, the first thing I would say is sobriety first, like don't be confused. Like there is a confused narrative out there that uh, that somehow like being vegan or being an athlete contributed to me getting sober and staying sober. And that's just not what happened at all. Like I didn't get and stay sober because I went vegan or 
became an endurance athlete. I got and stayed sober by overcoming denial, finding people to talk to, being honest, holding myself accountable, working a program in the secret rooms and, and helping others and working with a sponsor and doing an inventory and making amends. And it's really only when I created a solid foundation of sobriety that I began to expand in other areas like being vegan and becoming this middle-aged endurance athlete came many years after I got sober at 31. I didn't start doing ultras until I was 42. I mm. got, I got, you know, I went vegan at 40. So there's a decade after getting sober where I was trying to sort my shit out and get my life back on track before any of these other things. So this idea, this notion that, that the, the, the addictive that personality can just go from one thing to then you can put an athlete, you could put a, make him an athlete instead and he can channel and that, that compensates. I mean, yeah, you could, it's just, that's not how it played out for right. me. Like I had a decade of, of, you know, being a workaholic and like eating shitty food. I transferred many addictive tendencies onto other things that weren't drugs or alcohol. Um, and I, it took me a long time in my spiritual evolution to like grapple with those things. And as they say, the road gets narrower. Like when you first get sober, just to not drink is everything, mm. right? Anything else is fine. It's just like, just don't drink, right? And then the more emotionally sober you get, the less tolerant you become of other behaviors and proclivities that you have that used to not bother you. Like you just can't get away with it anymore because the more emotionally sober and mature you become, you realize that those things are at odds with you being the most, you know, actualized person that you can be. So whether it's, you know, going to gamble or shopping too much or working, whatever, you know, shitty self-care habits, whatever it is, like those things become, if you get sober enough, they become unbearable and they have to go as well. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, it's called slow variety. It takes a long time. Um, so in my case, these things didn't happen in lockstep. And so I just wanna um, impress upon anybody who's listening to understand that things like, you know, running, cycling, just, you know, self-care, physical fitness, diet, sleep, meditation, these things are all beneficial to sobriety and meditation is actually a, a core aspect of sobriety, but none of them can take the place of, of working a program. And I know there's various different ways of getting sober and staying sober, but you know, I got sober in 12 step and that got me sober, it's kept me sober. It's still the most important thing in my life. I tried all these other ways they didn't work. This is just work, what works for me. But I will say in more specific response to your question that getting sober led to performing more esteemable acts on behalf of myself and behalf of other people and esteemable acts in turn lead to elevated self-esteem, which in turn expands your horizon of what's possible for yourself. In other words, you begin to believe in yourself. You begin to believe that you can do more and you can be more. And that means that you end up taking on things that you never would have previously. You get more interested in bettering yourself and in improving the quality of life of those around you and challenges that once might've seemed impossible, you end up welcoming. And in my case, that took the form of these endurance challenges and later writing books, starting this podcast. For you, it's gonna be different, of course, um, but these are all practices that contribute and reinforce my sobriety, but they're not, um, they're not interchangeable with the program itself. Mm -hmm. Running specifically, I think is interesting. I think swimming is the same way as this practice of active meditation. Um, it's something that's very honest and, and keeps you honest. It doesn't care who you think you are, who you tell yourself you are, who you tell other people you know, who you are because it tells you who you are. Right. And, and that makes it this this amazing and beautiful template for for self discovery and, and self improvement and just it's just one of the reasons why I love endurance sports and that's all great, just don't replace a program, uh, your program for for running as a solution. Boom, that's it. We did. That's it. good. How you feel? I feel good, man. That was uh, feels good, man. It feels good, man, to like unload the. This is gonna it was be a lot chambered. There was like <laughs> six weeks of roll on energy that needed to be expressed. I don't know how long you've been going on for, but this it's was like a pressure valve. It's a finally, filibuster. Like, We're filibustering. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> it felt good, man. We, you know, I wanted to talk to you about this. I even suggested we do a remote one. Like, yeah, you know, I know. You, know, and like, I, you, you texted like me and you're like, let's do, let's, we got to do, we got to, maybe you could do a thing. Let's we'll go live. We got to talk about this. And I was tempted, but I was like, no, I'm not working. I no, cannot no, do this. No, so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't. It was worth waiting. You know, it's, it's funny. Like there's the thing in journalism, the later you are, the smarter you have to be. And so I think it was good you brought Arthur mm. and Giorgio in. Because <laughs> they look, they make both of us so look smart. smarter. Yes, exactly. I know, right? Yeah. They made it seem like we actually know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, no, they, I mean, they, it's amazing how much they know the inner workings. And, what, and right. it sounds like Arthur's connected to Anonymous. Yeah, he was, he was cagey about that. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, maybe we'll do a little research on that, who knows? <laughs> we should also point out that there's there's been lots of interesting articles uh, that Adam and I read in preparation to talk about the subjects today, which we'll link up in the show notes. Yeah. Some cool pieces by Taylor Lorenz and Kevin Roos, of course, who are the two journalists right. that I follow the most to stay on top of these particular issues, uh, as well as that Politico piece on Holly and some other things. So check the show notes for that. Um, we will be back here in two weeks' time. In the meantime, follow Adam at Adam Skolnick. You can leave us a message if you would like your question uh, considered for the podcast. That number again is 424-235-4626. Um, I already told you guys to check out the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, we did create a clips channel on YouTube. So if you do dig short chunks from the show or you want to just sample the guest before committing, you can find a link to that channel in the show notes or just search Rich Roll Podcast Clips on YouTube. That's it. Appreciate the love, you guys. See you back here uh, in a couple days with who's coming up next? Oh. Alexi Pappas. Ooh. It's a good one. That is good. Yeah. yeah. Have you checked out her book, Bravey? Not yet. Not yet. It. It's I, really good. She's I, a great writer. I, ha I have so to. Good. It's getting so much love yeah. and I can't wait to. I know. To... Jake Tapper yeah, tweeting I mean, about it. Come on. I mean, she's one of those. Adam Grant blurbed it. <laughs> I know. That's I, unbelievable. I, you know what? I think that's an audio book because she's so cool. I want to hear her read she's it. She's super so, cool. So I, I, yeah. I think that's an audio book. I'm yeah. going to, I've got credits. I'm with you on that. I'm going to grab it. Cool. All right, you guys, see you back here soon. Much love. Peace. Lance. Namaste.